will be the genuine chit chat after the after hours because that's the stuff we don't want everybody to hear. Yeah, that's not the stuff everything. that could get us fired. <laughs> not everything that I say of any slight importance is recorded. Uh, speaking, I of mean, which, I have started recording, but <laughs> I, I, I saw that. But I'm saying, like, I understand that. Did you ever read the Circle, Dave mm. Eggers, the Circle, or see the film? The film's mm. shitty, but <laughs> the idea in there is there's like uh, the main character May. She goes like totally transparent. Right. And um and so like there's a it's very reminiscent of nineteen eighty four and there's like the slogan sharing is caring. Right. And if you don't so she goes out late at night and like gets caught like kayaking and her boss like late at night she like bar, bar, steel borrows a kayak and she goes kayaking and she gets busted and her boss calls her and she thinks she's gonna get fired and her boss is like not mad that she got arrested, but he's mad because she didn't record it. So it's right. like my son's in a wheelchair. What if he wanted to experience what it was like to be in the kayak? You were being selfish. So like, <laughs> true. It's totally true. So she like totally goes totally transparent where her whole life is. It's like reality TV, but real reality TV, like totally on, like she's even got a timer of how long she's allowed to be in the bathroom to not be transparent. Cause that's the only time of day they don't see her. It's silly. So but it's the a reverse Truman show, like the, like Truman show, but with consent. Con- well, right. And then it's, you have to just set that's part of the conversation in the circle is, yeah. is it consent? Is it informed consent? Or is it like your job? Yeah. Yeah. Like there's that slippery slope in a way of like, how much are you willing to give up for X? But then it's like when, when the thing that you're being offered is like hard to refuse. And then when does it become borderlining blackmail? Because if I say, do this thing for me or I'll kill your family, you're like, whoa, that's blackmail. Right. But if I say, do this thing and I'll give you a million dollars, it's like, well, it goes right. into like the territory of the horrible monster that is Harvey Weinstein, things like that, where you're like, right. this, you are, what are you, what is the thing that you're asking for? What's the intent behind it? And what, what are you giving? And it's kind of, it's a kind of equation one almost has to do. Right. And what is your limit? And I think that's something everybody has to, has to do. Like, you know, we were talking a little off, off air and I won't get into the full specifics, but you know, like there's always those moments at work or in life or whatever, where you have to like make a decision. Um, like, are, what are you willing to say? Like, if I say this, will I lose my job? If I make this stand, what are the ultimate repercussions? And then you have to always have to ask yourself, like, well, can I sleep at night? Mm-hmm. If I, and you know, and it, that's that changes as you age too, right? You know, like what you're willing to do or not do at 18 or 20. Like, I, you know, how many people who were on the real world or who are on reality TV or on, you know, Temptation Island or whatever the shit that Chris and Dave watch? <laughs> How many of those people as a like now, and they're adult adults. I mean, all those shows, you got to be a consenting adult to be on there. But how many of them at 50 are like, man, I'm so glad I was on Temptation Island or whatever. Well, I can tell you for certain, I'm glad I wasn't at that age because I, I started releasing digital content um, in college. Uh, I, it was a, mm-hmm. a, a YouTube channel called Visual Digest. Um, we've hidden pretty much everything on there now, apart from like the odd thing. But yeah. it's it's something my, me and my buddy Reese did um, during college. Reese, the very first guest on Genuine. Very show. first guest and 100th as Hundredth. well. And he was yeah. in a few in the in-between as well. He pops up. Of the, well, he's got kids now, so it's not as easy to just... Yeah. Well, you know, when we're, when we're living... In, does he live in Wales too? No, his, his dad's from Wales. But it's oh, a good okay. Moment. He's okay. been... He, he, he has been to and fro was quite a lot of times because his dad lives there and things and it's only a three hour yeah. drive ish. Uh, but obviously where he's that was years ago when I started the pod, you know, six odd years ago. So it's like back then we lived together. So it's very easy to be like, easy. I'm starting right. a podcast. Do you just want to come out your room for like an hour and then go yeah. back in? Whereas now it's like you have two children <laughs> right. and a whole life, you know, what hence why certain do. guests of mine um, earlier on in the pod just haven't come up again. It's like sure. not because of my there's any issue with them, it's because their life has just changed slightly and that's completely yeah. fine. And when I hang out with them, I don't necessarily want it to always be recorded. Um, but it's, it's funny because me and Megan often, it's really funny with Megan because she often will say like, oh, I am, um, I don't want to do a podcast. I don't really fancy doing an afterthoughts on that movie or uh, not tonight. I'm a bit tired. And sometimes I'll, I'd be like, come on, do it. Go on. We'll just get it over and done with. And then, when she's on air, she loves it. Like she talks, yeah. like especially when it's the two of us and she talks and she's like, oh, I'm, I'm really tired. I want to end this. But here's a quick like eight minute anecdote on teaching on a review, yeah, film review I love that, it. where we only were doing a film review for six minutes, which is right. fine. I love it. But like with, with things like that, she's getting more into it. And like we're doing Clone Wars conversations and we recorded one recently. And she had to leave after half hour. 
Um, and then she was like, oh, I really, I, I, it's really annoying. I did that. And same with like, cause she, she had a really busy day at work and stuff. And then also because she was ill, she couldn't, uh, see, do the pod with Jack for Nomeo and Juliet. And now she's like, not like genuinely upset, like it's ruined a day, but she's like, oh, I really actually wanted to do that stuff. Yeah. And it's this little thing where occasionally the topic comes up where we're having a conversation. It was like, oh, it would have been good if we, if we were recording that. If or yeah. we do that, we sing little songs like Megan's quite, you know, sings a lot. I sing quite a lot as well. Not as often on afterthoughts on my patreon as much because i'm not the best singer but she's a really good singer uh she, she loves is. doing harmonies and things and so like with that it's there's little songs we do and it's like oh if we'd have recorded that and we've got like a ring camera in our lounge um which is for our dog willow because you know when we go out we can keep an eye on her in case of uh, anything and some there's been the odd thing we've got on that we're like oh that's cool we'll save that somewhere but most of the time we just we normally record in a different room so it's like there's certain things that just come up and we're like oh would have would be cool to record that but there's like a whole black mirror episode about recording I, everything and that becomes i'm a bit... sure i i should probably I, I you know i i i've not watched a ton of black mirror it's kind of one of those I've things where I've, of it. I've come to go and i know i know uh, scott and julian are yeah, yeah. going through them all yeah you know it, it is interesting though max and i were just we're just talking about this um he and i were texting each other back and forth random lyrics of a house of pain song mm. and uh and then we both got stuck on the we're like oh shit what comes next and um and then, you know, so then we were talking about how some of those cringy lyrics, if you've ever heard Jump Around by House of Pain, and uh, there's some pretty cringy lyrics in there. And so then um, I I sent him the bitmoji of like the the little me holding like the yellow face with the straight line over my face, like the embarrassed face. And I was like, 100% at some point in time, I sang every word to this song aloud in public somewhere, jumping at a party or whatever. And he's like, oh man, I need video of that. I was like, but this came out in 92. I was in college. I was at university, as you guys are saying. I'm like, we didn't do that. Like, I, And then I realized like my whole college career, I maybe have 10 pictures total of my whole time at university. And I lived there. I lived on campus of res- in America. You know, Most of your campuses are residential. So it was like my home for four years. And then honestly, even... Once I had the kids, I hardly took any pictures because film was expensive. It just wasn't something you could do. I couldn't, I didn't like have money to whip around. And then as technology changed, it got better. And then when I got together with Lee, you know, and the kids were a little bit older by that. So there's a lot more pictures of them once Lee got, came into our lives because she had a digital camera and that always helped. And, you know, you spend the money on a really good digital camera and then you get the little removable cards. You could get a shit ton. Um, and she just cares more about that stuff. So it's nice though. Cause like pictures we have around only exist because of her. And then, so Max and I were saying, and again, no shade at our kids or you millennial, but like, <laughs> I said to him, and like in the time that it t- took us, and Max is, you know, about what, 10 years younger than me, 10 years older than you. Like he's probably right between us, but he's like, uh, I said, at the time that you and I sat here and texted Max, our kids, because, you know, he's got what, four, three step kids, and, and I, you know, and we, we've got five. I'm like, they took more pictures just while we're not of, of themselves while we were talking than we ever took pictures of ourselves in our whole life. Right. And again, it's so it's just, it's, and again, they don't mean it. It's just what it is. Like you guys, your camera's on the phone. It's just what you know. It's easy to do. It doesn't take up any space. You don't have to think about what it costs. And 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 most of the time, you don't even look back at it at all. So it's like you're recording your life all the time, even though you're not. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but it's just because it's easy to do. And I don't know. It's I because I'm not. I'm not a big fan. I don't want to look at myself. I don't like have a lot of pictures of myself around. So, I mean, the thing I look up at myself is our drawing, our mm. comic book drawing. I have the original. Like, the original was sent to me. Sam well, sent it to me. I've got, I've got mine in a frame because I read... So, I'll grab mine. So you've... Wow, that's brilliant and amazing. So I've just got it here. It's tiny. I've got the original. This is the that's one. so cool. Sam touched it and sent it to me. This is it. That's so amazing. Yeah, because I drew this. it by hand. Yeah. That, that's incredible. Yeah. Mine mine i've been looking at mine for the last like year or two in that frame behind yeah. where the stuff is but literally because i was saying off off air like when i changed um when i add another screen i yeah. now need to wall mount these like above i've got like a, an area here so i'm gonna put them on the wall so i can always see them because there's just no sure. longer any space behind there yeah but but i mean it's funny the photos you say because i know what you mean and even when i see certain people who are younger than me who take photos it's it's normally a phase it's it's kind of it goes in waves because I found when I first got a camera phone, 
that was, I mean, camera phones when I first got them, when I was about 13, I think, I got like a Nokia phone because it was just, that was around the age where I stopped going to someone's house after school for mum to pick me up, like a childminder sort of thing. Um, and I started walking home by myself. So my parents were like, well, now that you've got your freedom, you're 13, you'd go to town with your friends, whatever, and like in, on a Saturday daytime, whatever, you're going to, pro- just in case for emergencies. And then it wasn't until I got to college, so I was like 16-ish, that I got a smartphone, which is still nowhere near as good as the ones now, but it had a it had a camera that wasn't atrocious. Like a camera where you take a photo and you could actually print it, not as some yeah. sort of abstract 8-bit piece. You know, it actually looks like something. Um and when that happened, I think that when I first got it, I was like, first of everything, everything that moves. Oh my God. It's because I used, my parents had a digital camera and a film camera and it got stolen. Oh. Um, some broke in our house and stole a bunch of electronics and stuff. And about six years of family memories on a cross between a video camera and a digital camera were gone. Right. Because um, they didn't, they weren't removed. Yeah. This SD card they, or the they, film wasn't as- removed. Yeah. 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 So it was, it was just gone. And yeah, exactly. And it's funny because I, I bleached my hair. I agree. I bleached my hair blonde for like a, a small... I bleached my hair completely blonde once when I was in uh, school, when I was like 14. And that's one of the time periods in the space it's taken. So there's there's one or two photos of me that exist where I've got blonde hair that you can nice. see. Bright blonde. I used to be called bleach um, at school. Bleach. Um, which is, yeah, yes. exactly. Um, so with the camera... That thing, was the though, joke. What does Snoop Dogg use to... to- Right in his weights. Yeah, bleach. Yeah, nice. that's right. Yeah, yeah, it's good. One. <laughs> um, but like with those cameras and things, like I, my, when we go on holiday, my mum would always take a camera, a digital camera, to make sure we get photos of stuff. You know, and I'm so glad she did because obviously when dad got ill and stuff, we've got quite a few photos of me and dad when I was younger and before he got ill and etc. But like, then I went for a phase where I wouldn't take photos of anything for ages. It was like when I moved out. I think when I was like nineteen twenty ish. Uh, not in the 1920s. I'm not quite that old. Uh, when I was amazing. 19 or 20 years old. You look great. We I were know. talking about you aging rapidly. So yeah, that well, is I, obviously a secret amazing. from Tonya, actually. Yeah, because she's, you know, vampire she's got, queen. She gave me the vampire blood. Yeah. Living for like, you know, millennia. And she just yeah. gave me a tiny trickle of the power. Um, no, so when I was 19 um, and I moved out and stuff like that, there was a period of time where I lived with Reese and uh, my mate Callum, who's also been on the pod, and we lived together for a couple of years, and it was like the party time of our lives. We had a big house, and we would like that we rented and have people over and have parties at, all the time. And there were, apart from like the odd photo that I would force people to take when I have a party, I'm like, right, everyone's going to hate it because no one likes taking photos at the time of the photo. But then you're so happy you've got one later on. So when there's a big group, I'd be like, right, it's it's mandatory photo. Everyone get in it. You know, I was like, if you act, if there's a genuine reason you really don't want to be seen at this party or anything like that but you know parents whatever i'm not going to force force anyone but everyone you know stop the music it's my house i can you know come in here the main part of the room you know we'll all do shots and stuff after just hit one photo please and that's it and because i've done those things i've got periods of time in my life where i've just got the odd one or two event photos like when me and megan go abroad we take loads of photos of holiday stuff and i normally look through them when i get home and delete 90 percent of them but it is nice, I think especially when family members pass away or when situations change that you can fall back on some of those things. like some, Or just like certain things that you may not actually remember that well. Like the house, this house we have, we um, we sold out the garden. It was like rubbish. There was just loads and loads of stones and stuff. So we dug it all up, moved all the stones out the front and then proper with a pickaxe and everything, dug up all the ground and put more soil and stuff in it and then grew our own grass and stuff. And we did that in like a day or so. And it's not something I occasionally forget we even did it because it's we did it so soon after getting the house. But we've got pictures of me and Megan and our friend Matt swinging a pickaxe. And so there's little moments like that. I'm like, I almost feel like a certain event, social or otherwise, it's good to take your phone out to take a couple of photos, like over maybe a five minute period. And then you put it away and then you're done. Because I had so many times where I just wouldn't take any photos. And I've got times where I saw friends I hadn't seen in ages, but I was so enthralled in seeing them. Like when I saw Scott, you know, Scott Weatherly, 20th Century Geek, when I went up to, um, I went, I was going somewhere with Megan. And so we met him near where he lives, we met at Costa. And we were chatting for like an hour and a half. It was great to see him in person. I didn't take a photo. I just completely forgot. And it's just like, oh, of all the of all the times, you're muted. And this was, your microphone's just died. How about that? Oh, there you go. Now you got it. Boo, wow. sorry. Now that you have was... to edit. Leave it in. But my yeah. favorite thing is like when you do, um, like, so I just went to a show. And I generally, when I go to a show, go to a concert, I don't 
gig, as you guys say. I don't. I always think like the gig is for the people in the band. Like you're <laughs> in, at, you're in, you have a gig as opposed to like at a gig. I know it's, it's silly, <laughs> but anyway, most like you go to a show and half the time it's like this. It's just the people are like yeah. they're holding their phones up. This is my phone. They're holding their phone up the whole time, and it's like, hey, you're at the thing. Like they're life size up there. They're right there's the band. Why do you want to watch them through here? And then you're never going to watch that video again. Now, normally I don't even pull it out, but I did because because I knew Max. I, I went and saw Tesla, uh, Junior Price's favorite band, and so I went and saw Tesla, having never saw them myself before. Um, so I knew Max wanted to get some video, so I did. But the opening act, and I sent some to Max. But the opening act sucked so much that I took some <laughs> video of the really crappy opening act because it's just like as it, I didn't post it. I'm not like here to publicly shame him. I'm no, not even no. going to say his name. But he was really, really bad. Because um, he would talk, right? He would talk, and he'd just be like us talking, and he and everything was like. Ugh! I talk, I could understand him. And then the song would start and the auto tune would come over and it was like terrible. It wasn't even rap metal. It was like rap, like rapping hard rock. It was te- awful. Um, and the band was fine. The band was a serviceable rock band. But the singer, songwriter, he was like, everything was the first whatever. This is the first blah, blah, blah. This is the first blah. Like they all can't be the first thing that you did. So I did take just like, but again, like, Three minutes, two minutes, because he sucked so much. I even sent it to Leo. I was like, oh, my God, this is the opening act. He's terrible. Um, we should form a band and just go on the road, because if this guy can open for Tesla. But again, it's always like, did they pick him? So they're like, oh, my God, Tesla's so much better than I thought. His voice sounds <laughs> great. God, he's, you know, all those years of smoking didn't ruin Jeff's voice at all. Whatever. <laughs> but then they came out. I played a couple, like this clip here, clip here, sent it, and then was done. But like when I went and saw They May Be Giants, the last couple of times, the phone never even leaves the pocket. Like, it's just not what I do. And when Lee and I would, would go to places, we would like do like, when I saw um, Mystery Science Theater 3000 did a tour, and it was Joel's last tour. So I got a picture of Joel coming out at the beginning. Because I'm there. Like, I, I would like to see you. I'm paying money to see the thing. Not like if I want to just watch a shaky YouTube cam, I'll just watch it at home on YouTube with somebody <laughs> yeah. else shaking shake, shake YouTube cam, right? With I someone don't, else singing, right? Was that, right, that's always the best, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. So, so it, it is almost. Um, it, it it is it is there was a, there was a book called The Future of Us, and it's Jay Asher, and I can't remember who co wrote it with him, but it was a young adult book, and it was written, I don't know, maybe like twenty twelve ish. And so it's like the internet is still sort of a baby. Um, you know, I mean, it, it, people have it. It's more ubiquitous. People are on there. People are on Facebook or whatever. But it takes place. It's a it's a science fiction book where the where the, these kids get an AOL disc, like they put the AOL disc and they get the free internet and they log into the future. Wow. And they discover and they're like, because, you know, when you, you figure out when the internet first, when you first get the internet, 1999, 2000, 2001, whenever you first get your home internet, 2005 even, maybe, you're like, the internet's important, right? And so if you're on the internet, it's news, it's college, it's something, it's a band, you're at a band, you've made a video. But like, you know, by the time everybody has a Facebook page, one of the lines is, are we famous in the future? Why are we on the internet? Like they don't understand. So it's like this whole deconstruction of their relationship through future social media. It was a really clever book because, you know, they're really good friends now. And then like the things that they do in their moment, and it's very back to the future frequency or whatever, you know, like whatever they do in their moment is changing their social media presence in the future. Mm, I see. But like just their perspective at the time of like, you know, you get online for like eight minutes. <laughs> then your parents are like, get off the phone. And that's it. That's all the time you have. You know what I mean? Yep. I was an I, adult, I, so I, I was that. the one. I, telling, I remembered, telling yeah, my, having yeah. that exact experience. Exactly. So anyway, so it's, 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 I get it though. I mean, we're on the internet. This will be on the internet. Podcasts exist because of the internet. Like we're radio people now. Mm. Like everybody's got a radio show. I always in, call, I radio. call podcast shows, right? It is like indie radio. And I call... And I was radio. I did radio in college. Um, I call this a show. Like I say, this is a show. I'm going to do yeah. a show on my on my calendar. It says I'm going to do a show. Got a show today. Lee calls it a show. But there's other people like you called. You know, like friend of the pod, friend of the pod um, thing. But one of the groups that I'm in, one of the discords I'm in with the cover to credits show, the podcast I like. 
um, or it's a librarian and her husband, and they read books and then watch the movie. I, t- I mentioned it in the Thousandth Show. Whether this comes out before or after that, this will be before. Um, this is coming out like this weekend, so this is okay. So yeah, straight. So out. um, so covered a credit. But anyway, so I always say, like one of the questions I ask them is like, well, what's your favorite show? And they're like, what show? I'm like your show, the show that you do every two weeks. They're like, oh, we don't think of it as a show; it's a podcast. I think it was like episodes. I say, if you said, what's your favorite show? I'd be like. Parks and Recreation, I guess. Yeah, Maybe. okay, I, I see, I, see. Well, if you say, what's your favorite podcast show, I'd be like, uh-huh. w- you can just say podcast. But it's weird, because po- mm. podcast is simultaneously, this genuine chit-chat is a podcast. Yes. What we're recording right now is a podcast. I yeah. have 500 uh, odd releases of podcasts. Yeah. And it's like, what's your, if you said to me, what's your favorite podcast, I'd, I, yeah. I'd either say to you, you know, Comics Emotion Network or whatever, yeah. you know, what I listen to the most. Or I'd say my personal favorite podcast I did was this one. You know what I mean? Like, sure. You don't call them individual ones. You don't call them shows. I, show for me is genuine chit chat is a show I do. But Got it. if I if I say to someone, oh, I have I have an internet show, they'd be like, okay, it's like YouTube is that this is that. Right. Whereas I if I say a podcast, it's like it, it indicates it is a primarily audio with potential video whereas i think that's the show a download in general that's is not like, live yeah either. i think show for me insinuates visual element being hmm. the priority i guess sure. yeah words are fine they are the reason I mean, we yeah. were talking about the whole the weird thing with calendars that in america yeah, oh my god what the fuck what man? The, uh, how your calendars okay so start... wait, if you get out your phone yeah okay yeah, and yeah on your phone your calendar on your phone like i'm gonna pull out my monthly calendar on my phone hold on, let me yeah. get a month where are you month Sunday. No, mine starts. Uh, where is it? Mine starts Monday. There, there it is. That, that's the default. Yeah, it's because it's the right to thing your to phone. do. It's only at sixteen percent. Uh, no, I know. It's um, I've been this, I'm charging it. This is incorrect. This is what the default is. So we wrote because Lee, Lee said to ask. So I've asked. Nonsense. I'll tell her. I don't understand how anyone. And sorry for any listeners um, who can hear me and see me on YouTube, uh, wiping my nose. I've got a bit of a cold. Yeah, yeah. I mean, th- here's the thing though. This month started on a Monday, so ultimate satisfaction. The thing is, is you know, I'm yeah, fine with a lot of the differences we have of America and England. You guys do certain things way better. I think Ladybug makes far more sense than Ladybird. Uh, Cotton candy sounds far more appealing than candy floss. But the thing is, one hundred percent candy is, floss. I don't yeah, that sucks ass. Why would you do that? And you can't even floss with it. It's literally not that consistency. Yeah. It doesn't make no. no sense. But the the Sunday thing is a hill I'll die on because the Sunday is a part of the weekend. The weekend is only two days and maybe arguably part of Friday. You can't have a day in the weekend which also represents the start of the week when the working week also starts on Monday. That does. There's no. The only reason one could argue that, and I think it's probably why America does it, is because where Sunday was classed as essentially the day of rest, so it was Jesus almost day. like because yeah, of Jesus. It's almost yeah. like Monday to Saturday are all work days, and Sunday's the one day that you kind you of start get to do your what you week. Want. You start your week with Jesus, or that, or it's kind of like, hey, let's start start the week with the rest or with Jesus yeah. rest. It's it's that's why I imagine it is. I mean, we historically are. Know. It's weird because Britain is historically more of a christian country in a lot of ways because well, christian well, and catholic because we literally created religion well, yeah we basically went hey we see what you're doing over there uh romans and in europe we what we're gonna do that. is we're gonna carve bits of i will say we henry the eighth did it basically by himself um yeah. he carved a bit of it out and then when you see these two bits are almost identical his slight tweaks just to adhere to my, yeah. my lifestyle and then it it's was like all about him yeah christianity Divine right of kings yeah yeah and you it think is insane nation, it's just not that godly surprisingly well because when you're but the reason you're not is because of what you just described it. Like, on paper, you all know that your king was like, oh, Rome, France, you papists, as you would call, <laughs> as they would call them, the papists. That was always the big problem with Mary, right? Queen of Scots, is she was a papist. And what are we going to do? And she, like, had to, like, decry being Catholic. And that's part of what kept her from being queen, right? Mm. I mean, Mary, Queen of Scots, did all the right things. But, like, Elizabeth, who was the queen... Elizabeth the first, who's a badass, who, by the way, good choice. I, you know, no offense to Mary Queen Scott, she's super cool too. But like, I mean, Elizabeth the first, total badass. We didn't Glad choose her to, cl- to clarify. That's but the whole you thing of the monarchy. Chosen. No, no, no. They could have picked Mary on paper. Mary Queen of Scots on paper had the right to the throne, but right. because she was raised in France and she was married to the French, she was a papist, and they were like, we don't want that. Like she had to like 
denounce her Catholicism, and that's ultimately what kept her from being the queen of the of of England, queen of the UK, was because she was Catholic. So it's like on paper, everybody's like, "Oh wait, wait, wait!" So the so the bastard daughter of the guy who changed the religion to the Anglican Church, like it's that close, like. Her dad's the one who did it, but you, that was the hill you were going to die on. You're like, we could just undo this and go back to being Catholics. It was just like eight minutes ago, <laughs> but we would rather have the bastard daughter. And, you know, like being a bastard in England is a big deal. And mm. Elizabeth, you know, is, I mean, I, again, I think you guys made the right choice. She's a badass. Historically, badass. She defeat, you know, she was responsible for the defeating of the Spanish Armada. Good on her. She's awesome. I'm glad you guys picked her. No offense, no shade to all the Scott heads out there. But what I'm saying is, um, it's all garbage. So you just argued it right there because you're like, well, he's just like, I just didn't like this because it's the film I like. So I'm just going to make a whole new thing that God said. Hmm. No, you said, Hank, it was you, pal. You were like, none of these ladies are giving me boys. And then ultimately, his youngest daughter, <laughs> and she doesn't have children or get married. Love it. Also, the, about it. the irony is I'm, I'm fairly certain that the sperm is the determining factor of the gender of the child. 100%. Yes. So the irony of King Henry VIII is it's, it was it's no one's fault because you can't choose those kind of things. But if it is anyone's fault and you're going to put blame on anyone, you have to actually blame yourself, put which is the biggest him. irony. Yeah. He basically yeah. split the entire, like, you know, Catholicism and Christianity make up. That, well, it's it's hard to I know there is quantifiable there's numbers but it's basically one of the most popular religions on the planet is Catholicism slash Christianity and it's yeah, funny sure. that he put one of the biggest wedges amidst those two religions in history I know there've been countless other religious wars on behalf of Christianity etc but he basically did put the biggest wedge in that basically because he couldn't have children of a gender and he wasn't and he didn't know it was his own fault so he was blaming someone else so the biggest change in religion uh, in the last like 400 years excluding new religions that have emerged yeah. is all because of a guy blaming someone else for his faulty sperm and i say faulty Wait, loosely you're saying the patriarchy is is a small-minded and stupid it's a what? small from a small-minded stupid white guy with too much power and privilege. shocking what? that doesn't the patriarch no the patriarchy that that, doesn't that is strange this no. is this episode this part of the episode brought to you by the feminine the collective. collective yes <laughs> no as as but we are both feminists though mm. and so that's fine like i am i mean i was a women's studies minor you know in college undergrad and my undergrad I mean, my you university know more about women's studies and you know more know more about british history than i do by this conversation <laughs> so most of what i know about the monarchy is from the crown and i have to double check and fact check that after most each episode of it, yeah you do have to like we do yeah. that too we watch like i've not watched the final season yet it's but we because you know we lived i mean i really have enjoyed that show and i, I think the middle the middle cast is my favorite okay yeah uh, well uh, the margaret thatcher series is my favorite season I think Gillian Anderson is oh, just great. But that was phenomenal. still Olivia Coleman. Yeah, Dude, yeah. That was that yeah. group. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Megan's favorite is um, Claire Foy, but I love all three. I mean, I reasons. think Claire Foy was spectacular and having Lithgow was awesome. Mm. And, and the woman who played Margaret, I mean, that's the thing. Like, Margaret's always the star. So it's like, yeah. you and the woman, I can't even think of who played Margaret in the first two. She was great. And then, you, but you bring Helena Bonham Carter Oof, in. Who's one of my favorite people on the planet. And I have she's, a completely unashamed crush on her. And I always have. She and always will. crushed it. See her now. And she's substantially older than me. And I'm like, you are essentially a fox. You have got the personality. <laughs> you see her in a conversation with anyone. And I'm just like, you just bring joy, but you're weird. You're a weird. I mean, so she's married weird. to, obviously, Tim Burton. So you've Tim got Burton. to be a, a level yeah, yeah. of weird to, to stay in that for that long. But I'm yeah. like, your weird kookiness, unashamedly, I love, I love any middle-aged women especially when they are weird and they finally kind of, the, because society is the way it is, patriarchy, etc. so much of women's internal just weirdness of doing weird shit is stamped out. And normally right. I find that women, um, I think Emma Thompson's a bit like this as well. They get to that certain age where they're like, I don't give a shit anymore. I'm I just, give a shit. And so I'm going to be yeah. weird, but I'm going to kind of, not consciously, but make up for how I've been repressing my weird. And I'm just going to be crazy weird all the time. Well, but in, not I in a horrible way. And I love it. Yeah. That's, I think that's why Helena was so perfect for Margaret. Mm, yes. Because like she, and the woman, again, and again, it's funny because the woman who played her in the first, the first two was more to how big Margaret was, you know, it's yeah. like, but then you bring Helen, I mean, you get, you get Helen Bonham Carter, you get Helen Bonham Carter, but like, they both leaned so hard in to her being just a loon and like having a ball. Like I love, like she knew who she was. She knew what she was. She knew she was the spare. She mm -hmm. loved everything about it. And so I think Helena Bottom Carter just captured it so perfectly because like everything that you just said, she's like, I don't want to be the queen. 
I want to be Margaret. Like Margaret's the role. That's yeah. the one you want, right? I mean, like if there, if you can't, I mean, and Olivia Coleman was spectacular, but um, and I love the opening, the transition scenes from from Monarch to Monarch. How they do, they show pictures of the previous ones yes. of them. Like so, in the opening one when Coleman came on and they're getting the new stamp. Yes, and they show the old stamp with Claire Foy, and she's like very clever, so good. And she does the ch- the tap under her the- under under her chin. So that the was woman very good. Is uh, Vanessa Kirby is the actress who played the early Margaret? Yeah, phenomenal, absolutely uh, amazing. And I just all, think all the Margaret casting is it's spot on. Yeah, and I think she really. Um, but again, it's a fun role to play, and and you get in the same who plays Anne in each each season. The the, yes. the characters play Anne because again, she get you can just those. And again, I feel like Princess Anne also is kind of like can be a little rogue and she can say whatever she wants. She can get away with more. And so I think like the actors who play her too are also having a lot of fun, especially in that middle season when they're younger. That's my um, favorite Anne. Yeah. That's... Yeah. Yeah. She's very good. She was very charming. And you were just like, but also you felt bad for her. Like you could see her feeling bad for Charles, but you could also see how you could feel bad for her. And it was like very, but she's always, and again, the the one who won't be, you know, the one who can't be the the crown. You, there's always that thing. And of course, with Harry, it's the same thing. I think there's this, there's the public has a fascination with them. Yeah. And especially because this family is only the, in the monarchy because of their uncle. Yeah. Making a choice. Like none of them. So like this whole thing that you've got Charles, you've got Anne, you've got, or you've got Harry, you've got Anne. Yeah, because pre Margaret, it's pre World War Two, the, yeah. the the in case people aren't aware, and I know this again from the Crown, um, the <laughs> Queen's dad, King George the Sixth, was it? I think Sixth, whatever or, he became, uh, yeah, the King George know. the Something. He was the younger brother. The only reason he became king is because his brother abdicated from the crown and basically disgraced the family, and then World War Two falling in love, and of course yeah. you know it's well, a I good mean, choice because he was a Nazi, so it's probably well, he, good. yeah, and he uh, yeah, and the, the Crown is an episode <laughs> that does kind of go into that, and it's like I mean, there's also huge issues with the monarchy historically both modern times and you know very recent history and going back the generations of racism and all kinds of issues yeah. and a lot of colonialism is heralded by the monarchy so let's not forget that but i'm not gonna it's, forget that. No, you won't i i'm trying to remind myself because the crown is such a good show and i kind of it is loosely really forget good. about those things but i'm like yeah. the crown is such a good show because it made me interested in britain in a way because it, it shows the history of britain since just before world war ii but from the perspective of the royal family and although certain things are dramatized i did look up quite a few things and there was little the broad strokes are correct and obviously they can't know the conversations but there are certain instances where it's like oh this character's at the party and they're like they never were and i'm like why right. why put the amount you've added to the plot of having them there compared to how much you take out for historical reasons like there's certain things i know why they did xyz but there's other things i'm like why did why did they not do that like there's this isn't a spoiler or anything but in the last season five and six of the crown there's two members of the royal family who are quite prominent members who are just never in it just right. and there's no falling out with the actors who played them there's no controversy of them like there is with you know, andrew or anything like that it is literally just they're in one scene very briefly and then me and megan were like they haven't shown up again what happened i looked up i was like maybe they've there's andrew kind of stuff there no one of them does like a production company and it's it's just because they were loosely not relevant and i'm like but they were at certain events and you you cast the actors you just just use them yeah Yeah, but it may be that's what we say historical dramas is like watch them and get yourself interested but then make sure you do error correct in a sense well and i would say too if you if you if you're fascinated if you're done if you've got a fix i would say watch victoria I've heard I've heard that's good. Mm. I have got I, I do want to download I've got it on my audible wish list, but I probably won't get to it until next year. Yeah. Harry's autobiography spare. I've heard mixed oh, yeah. things about it, but I'm just like I'm kind I'm loosely interested in the concept of the spare. I know they say it in the crown quite a bit. Yeah, yeah, the air and the spare. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I I I remember when I saw that was gonna be the title of his book, I was like, Oh damn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just call just calling it out. Um because that's what they are. But yeah, I would say watch Victoria because again, the, the interesting thing about Victoria, and I, that was really good. The show, the acting is superb. The sets are beautiful. It's awesome. Um, and again, sometimes we'd be watching it and we'd be like, huh. And so I don't know if it was ITV or BBC for you. It was on PBS for us. So, but um, there were three seasons of it. COVID shut it down. They're all great. Um, the There's again, the the accidental king in there because like Vicky, Victoria's oldest daughter, Everybody says, and even Bertie, her son, who goes on to be Edward, whatever. Um, <laughs> even he was like, 
as he aged, thought Victoria, his sister Vicky, should be quick. Like she's smart, she can pick up languages, she has social skills. Yeah, like he didn't, but because he was the boy, firstborn son, even though Vicky was older. So it's a really interesting look too at the way, and again, how Victoria comes to be the monarch is totally accidental. And Rufus Sewell is in it. Um, he plays the prime minister for a while. He's excellent, and so the the supporting cast they get to come in. Again, really interesting stuff, and um, um. I find Victoria fascinating. Um, how do you know about the monarchy and stuff? Because I assume you weren't taught it in school. Like, what what piqued your interest uh, about it? Where'd you? Well, it just I mean, just re- <laughs> reading. What you reading? You don't, you're not really a fan of books, though, are you? I Tony? am a big fan of books. Are you? Most of it. It is. It is. A lot of it is historical fiction. A lot of it is just the characters exist in books, right? Yeah. So the Austin characters, the monarchy is alive and well. Um, the Bronte books. So a lot of it starts there, and it's like you said, you get yourself interested, and then you're like, well, the fictional version of this person, the fictional version of this queen, the fictional version of this king, whatever, and then you so then you chase it down. So a lot of times it could just be a movie, it could be a work of historical fiction or whatever, but again, I grew up, I'm a Gen Xer, and so keep in mind, I we were part of the Charles and Diana TV mm. thing. So my I was very young when that happened. I had no concept. We watched, I mean, we saw it on TV. Like the whole country stopped to watch mm. watch their wedding. And so like my mom worked in an elementary school for a short time and my elementary school. And uh, um one of her um one of the other teachers' aides there, uh Chris Mail, they're from England. The males are from England. Mm. And so we were just sort of friends with them. So I grew up with these three British, like Tracy and- Are they the uh, friends who got you Terry Stockle oranges? Or are they that's fr- them. Yeah. That is them. Go. Yeah, yeah. That's how I first- So so it's sort of, we just sort of knew about it. And then again, when I didn't know anything, I, I mean, as young as I was, when I didn't know anything, I went to the library. You talked about like being 13 and having a phone. And Jack was talking about when his when his oldest hit 11 and could walk himself home, they, he finally got his phone. And it's funny, I think about like being seven is just walking alone to the library. I don't, like, I'm not sure I was ever alone at that age, apart from all the time. Like maybe came, in the toilet and in bed. The most time I was uh, by myself was when I was in bed asleep, air quotes, with my globe. I had one of those globe lights, like a night light. Yeah, was a globe. sure. I had one of them yeah. and I used to leave it on reading all night. night. And it used to get so sure. bad that the light bulb would bur- burn the top of the thing where the it globe bit connects. Yeah. Because I'd, I'd leave on all night reading. So, yeah. Sorry. That's the yeah. wrong. Yeah, no, no, it's fine. So, like, but, my, you know, growing up in the 70s, and then, you know, like, be, I was born in 73, and then, you know, then being, you know, uh, like a single age, becoming 10 and a teenager in the 80s. Oh, yeah, we just did. Like, we were just gone wandering around. Like, so, like, we, my grandparents had the farms. So we spent our whole summers on the farm every day, all day, and on the weekends and stuff during the school year. But, like, even then, you could just kind of just go and be out, and they would be, like, be home by dark. And, like, literally, my there was, like, a bell. They rang the bell, and it was loud enough. There was, like, by the door. And that meant, get your ass home. Um, when my, pa- my parents had it, we would go camping sometimes on the weekends during the summer. So, like, the farm, because of Jesus, um, the market's closed. My, we had a fruit farm. My grandparents did. And so you'd literally, six days a week, you'd get up, crack a dawn, eat breakfast, go to the market. And you there's like six lanes and you would bring your wares in. We'd have three or four trucks of whatever we were selling and you'd get in line. And then there would be a lottery every morning and whatever lane you were in got to go first. So if you got in the wrong lane, so we always had three trucks. So we had a 50% chance of going first, but wow. you know, 50% chance of going last too. So You'd get there like five o'clock in the morning because it was literally lining up. So the sooner you could get your truck unloaded, the sooner you could get home. But then you'd get home and the workers, the the migrant workers that my grandparents paid to pick all their fruit were working all morning. We'd come and then we'd go out to the field and bring it in on the tractors and we'd pack fruit and we'd have lunch and then we'd pack fruit until the until the trucks were full for the next day. So all of that to say my grand my parents had a camper. And so we would camp on the weekends. And after my grandparents lost the farm when I was 12, we spent more time, a little bit more time at the campground on the weekends. But um, even like seven, eight, nine, they'd be like, I would just wander out. I slept in a tent. My parents had a trailer. I had a tent. I just slept in the campsite next to them yeah. by myself in a tent with my books and my comics and everything. And um, so, yeah, we just did whatever. And so my little town uh, where I lived there was a, the library was maybe a mile and a half, two miles from my house. And then later it moved a little bit closer, but I would just go, I'd get on my bike and just be gone. And I'd leave the house at like 
Do you in the by morning. yourself at these times, or would you meet up with friends and stuff? Sometimes I'd meet up with my cousin Noom. Sometimes it'd be friends, but a lot of times I'd be by myself. Just go, just wander around or go hiking. Well, we had a dog. Um, Augie was his name, Augie Doggy, and he would sometimes go with me. Um, but yeah, a lot of times it's just me wandering about. Like, and you know, I was a latchkey kid, so I would just come home alone. So my sister's four years older than me, and we didn't get out of school at the same time. So even like kindergarten, I would just come home and I'd get off the bus. And then I have to walk from the road where the bus was to my house, which is about half a mile. And then I just let myself in and just be home until my until my sister got home. And then she'd get home. And then it would be two of us. So like a five-year-old and a nine-year-old just home alone until whatever our parents got home. I don't think I was home alone at all until I was 10 or 11. And that was only when they'd go out for like a meal without me, which was quite rare. Mm. Uh, on certain weekends, I'd be... It was, yeah. it was when I got to like 13, 14. I think 14 was the real... Equit's mature age. Sure. And I'd go into yeah. the, the town with friends, like th- we'd call for each other, you know, go to each other's yeah. houses and stuff like that. Certain friends did that earlier than others, but yeah, I was if never... you wanted your friends too, like so in the new in the in the new book, the third one that I'm working on, it takes place in the eighties, uh late 1989, 1990. So like phone calls were expensive. So there's like this whole thing I write about phone calls in this book about how expensive it is to make phone calls. And, you know, like in the time of the internet and the time of smartphones, you don't think about your phone plan. Like you pay $50 a month and that just is everything. You can call like international calls. Like we can call, we can use the internet. Like we could use WhatsApp to call or whatever. Or if you have FaceTime, if you have, uh, if we both had iPhones, we could talk on the phone. But, you know, Back then, like you couldn't even call across town. If it depends on where the lines were, it could be long distance. So if if you had a friend who was in town, but it was technically a long distance call, you'd just ride your bike over or just walk over and see if they were around. Or sometimes you just ride your bike by their house and see if they were out in their yard. And then if they were, you'd go by and hang out. If not, you just ride by and they weren't there. You didn't see them that day. Um, so so like that was that was just it. And then we every there were pay phones, and so again, things weren't free. So we had a we had a system. If you'd call and let it ring twice, like if you were at a basketball game and you wanted to get picked up because the game was over, you'd call and let it ring twice and hang up. And then that meant your parents to know to come pick you up. Mm. But if something changed, you would call and you would make a collect call, but they would deny the charges. So a collect call is you pick it up, you don't have money for the payphone, <clears throat> And you pick it up and you'd say, call this number, I need to make a collect call. And so while the operator is connecting and they're like, so they would answer and say, we have a collect call from Tony. They could hear my voice so I could talk over the top of the operator. And then they would say, deny the charge. Yep. So you could just be like, the game's in overtime and then hang up. And then wow. they heard it, didn't have to pay for the call. Like we were cheap. Like, again, I've said before, I didn't know we were broke until I went to college. Like I didn't know. I thought we were just working class families. So, like those are the tricks that we did to save money. Um, you know, long, all that stuff. So it was just like wandering around aimlessly didn't cost anything. Going to the library didn't cost anything. So like I learned a lot of stuff. So again, you'd watch something, you'd read something, you'd see something. So you'd see Diana and Charles get married. You don't know anything about it. Go get a book on the monarchy. Mm. That would be a thing I would do. Like I would read, I like historical fiction leads me to fiction. So like for you, it's like the crown is historical fiction, but then you read the book. Right. So I've read, I just recently, the reason Mary Queen of Scots, I've read several books about Mary and Elizabeth, but I just read another one. It was called Young Queens and Mary Queen of Scots was one of the three. So I've read, so it's like the third book I've read on Mary. <laughs> on, on Mary. Wow. That's She's, what... It's it's fascinating. It's just one of those things where I find, and I, I've read, I've read several books on Victoria. Hmm. She fascinates me. I just, I think specifically monarchs, female monarchs, like I don't hmm. really know a ton about George. I don't know a ton about Edward. I don't know. I mean, we know about Henry because of Anne Boleyn and because of Elizabeth. Like, you know more about their dads. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the but the female monarchs always have fascinated me mm. because um, boss, like to pull that shit, like, you know, the whole country like is technically loves you, but they also hate you because yeah. you have a vagina. A hundred percent. It's, it's all those fuck? years ago. It was literally just like randomly is like, okay, we're doing this weird borderline blood ritual thing to make you the most powerful person not only in this country and this nation but also arguably europe and then at some point to the world Definitely we're making the you world. this thing and you're like 
okay, it's by this weird blood thing. Right, but it's only boys, right? Unless there are no boys, then it can be a girl. It's like, right. So you're saying that women are capable. No, no, no. Women are inferior beings in every single way and can't vote or or think or read or do anything like that. They're baby makers. But but with this weird blood ritual, you want to make these people that you're claiming can't do anything to become the most powerful individual in the whole world. Yeah, it makes complete yeah. sense. And you're like... Total. What? I mean, I'm glad... I, I think that probably the women being in power ha- help, as in... Uh, as many issues as there are with the monarchy, I suspect that there being queens in the British monarchy over the last however many centuries has probably been more beneficial for well, women's rights. You know, for I, I'd be, the world. Yeah, for, I, for, I would be everybody. very. Yeah. I think especially recently with uh, Queen Victoria the Second. Is that a que- is that the queen who just passed Elizabeth away? The second. Elizabeth, Elizabeth the Second. Elizabeth. Why did yeah, I say? Because yeah. you've been mentioning Victoria. I should yeah, known yeah. as Elizabeth the Second because yeah, yeah. they call Elizabeth in um yeah yeah uh, Lilibet in the Crown. Lilibet. But yeah, um, it's it's one of those like she especially like there's so many scenes in the Crown where I where it's talking about certain things and there's a lot of prime ministers who are a lot of bravado and they realise they go into the room with the Queen and any misstep she has the power she never does but she has the power to step you back in line and it's one of those interesting things and it's it's one of those bizarre things because not always but there's a i think a high percentage of individuals in the uk who are royalists who are like super for the monarchy and will not take any criticism they are generally more conservative leaning and generally more conservative leaning people are less progressive with a woman's place in the world, which of course is completely equal to men. It's this yeah. really weird thing where people who worship the queen more than anything are also the ones saying that women are inferior to men in some way, or at least passively thinking or acting like that. And I'm like, I the cognitive dissonance it's you insane. must have to to have those opinions is so baffling to me, but it's so widespread and it's so weird and so frustrating, which is a part of the reason, again, why I've always steered away from monarchy related politics because i'm like sure uh, they they didn't we no one voted them in they're just this you know family on a power trip through a, a weird bloodline they've had this huge amount of history to the uk whether or not they make more money for the country or cost them more i know that's a hot debate all the time i don't really know that well every time i look into it, it seems to be a different answer but it, it it's one of those strange things where like i never delved into it but some people are so so passionate and i just it's, think it's it's yeah, bizarre it's to not me. Passionate. It's more just interest for me. I just find it oh, no, fascinating. Yeah. I'm not saying you. I'm talking about these. No, royalists. no, but I get it. Yeah. And the people who are royalists totally get. It. And the, the favorite thing, though, like here's a fun thing to like bring up to the royalists is like here's a fun thing to just consider that Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip, love story of the ages. Both of them, <laughs> Queen Victoria was both of their grandmothers. Yeah. Just sit with that. Yeah. Just sit with that. Like. Just sit with that. And like that was actually one of the things because in the Young Queen's book, so um Elizabeth with an S, not not your British Elizabeth, but your but your French Elizabeth, who then went on to be the Queen of Spain. Because interestingly, you talk about queens. If there's a king, his bride is the queen. But if it's a queen, her husband is a prince. Yeah, very clearly putting that line. That's a very, you'd think it wouldn't happen, would you? You'd think oh, because this is an the king to get... always usurps. Yeah, exactly. It's so there, but you're because the, the king, Philip. He was not. He doesn't have the blood. He was royal enough to marry in because obviously his his grandma was. The, they have the same grandma. Gross. <laughs> but anyway, one of the one of the people, and I think it's I, I I can't remember who it was, but there was one member of the royal family who they said he had four. So you should have two. You should have four grandparents, eight great grandparents, and sixteen great great grandparents. Right? He had six great grandparents. No, four great grandparents and only six great great grandparents. That's yeah. how inbred he was. That's that's what that's a problem too. So when people are super royalist, you're like, let's just let's just calm down about this weird blood feud thing. If you ever read Garth Ennis's Preacher, they kind of found, which is a hard read, I understand. But again, if you read Preacher towards the end of Preacher, when the when it's kind of jumping the shark a little, there is a um, you see what happens. When you keep inbreeding a bloodline for centuries, mm-hmm. uh, did you ever read Preacher? No, no, I haven't. I've seen trailers of the ad- adapted TV show. That's as far and as I, I've gone. The show was pretty good. Um, you know, it was Seth Seth Rogen produced it, and he was yeah, a big I fan of the show. I, I yeah. think when he was producing that, that was one of my big Seth Rogen phase of trying yeah, to yeah. assume everything he did. It's really good. I would say, like, I would say, give it give it a shot. Um, uh, the the woman who plays Rose is is exceptional. Um. 
And of course, her name is eluding me right now, and it'll pop up in a second. Um, but I would say give it a watch. But anyway, um, but in that, it towards the end of the comic run, there's this conversation about how inbreeding goes wrong. So again, I just find it fascinating. I do think it's it's kind of like so. I was ranting in our Discord about like my stupid governor just dropped out of the presidential race and literally spent hundreds of millions of dollars. And my joke was to make like 27 people in Iowa pledge fealty to him and say they like him. And it's true because like in Iowa, it's the big thing in America. The first caucus is Iowa, but it's not a vote. It's not a primary. It's a caucus. Literally the way that it works is you go to a caucus site and you stand around in certain bunches and you're like, I'm going to vote for this guy. I'm going to vote for this gal. And then you like, can you can auction off. You can be like, no, I'm going to go over here. It doesn't look like this person is going to win. So I'll switch my vote until the end of the night. You literally move around a gym say. So like, Somebody's like, he won, like Trump won the Iowa caucus by 50%. Now, okay, he, that's true. He did. He got 50% of the Iowa caucus vote, but like only about 14% of registered Republicans actually vote in the caucus. And it's not really, you're not really voting in that way. So it's like truly 50,000 people picked him out of the whole state of Iowa, out of the whole. 300 million people in America, but it's like, oh, he's going to win because he won because 50, 50,000 people in a state of 3 million people said they like him in a cold gym on a Monday night in the middle of January. I mean, that's how stupid it is. So it's like, those are the things like, that's what I feel like with the, like you were trying to like explain the weird, but it's like, it's so weird. It's like some weird fluky thing that got you here. And it it's not, it's not a majority. It's not even a plurality. It's just like eight people standing around. And they decided. So when you go back, that's how that's what the monarchy fascinates me. Cause you're like the decisions that it make, like if one thing went the other way, if one bullet was this way, like if like what happens if Archduke Ferdinand doesn't die? Mm. Right? Not only does world you don't care, you may still have gotten World War One because you still tried to kill him, but what happens if he doesn't die? Like I often think in my country, like my alternate reality story, if I could ever write one, I would love to hear what yours is. Is Jimmy Carter wins a second term? So it's who, real. Who do you, is so it, Jimmy, do you lose against George W? No, no. George Jimmy Carter lost to Reagan. Reagan. That's it. Sorry, I'm getting. Yeah, my, yeah. He lost in 1980. Right. So, like, just before he leaves the White House, he put solar pa- panels on the roof of the White House. He would go on TV. There was an energy crisis when he was president, and I remember. I remember it. Like, he's my president. Jimmy Carter is my 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 guy. He was doing charity work when he was like 97 years old. I was like, yes, wasn't it? Yes, 99. He's still wow. he's still with us. It was his wife that just died. He was like a he was in the navy. He's just this amazing guy. Love him. But anyway, he would actually go on TV and he'd like have a sweater on and he did this whole like fireside chat like FDR. But he would like turn the thermostat down in the White House. He's like, we all have to do our parts. So we're gonna all like he was all about if he had been president. I mean, seriously, the world would be totally different. Not that there'd be flying cars, but we would have hydrogen cars. Well, also, Reagan's obviously policies, you know, very much the war on drugs got reignited with Nancy Reagan's, you know, yeah, right. stupid propaganda. Yeah. Just say no to drugs. You've solved the crisis that you created. No. Cor- right. Well, and it didn't solve anything. <laughs> no, it only it's made never it worse. Had. You can't and war so, on choice. It's insanity. Right. Sorry. <laughs> it's, it is, no, no, it's true. But like, so that to me, like in my own history, in my own life, the moment I would like to see the alternate history is Jimmy Carter getting reelected. So we watched the For All Mankind show on Apple TV, which is like an alternate history that takes place like the Russians land on the moon first and the first person on the moon is a woman. That's mm-hmm. the reality. But like all the real characters still exist, like Buzz Aldrin still there, like these, but they've created different characters and like sometimes they real people show up and sometimes they don't. But this whole series is this alternate reality of what happens if the space race doesn't end and women were in space too it's amazing it's amazing there's like a woman president and she's gay and it's super cool and it's like but it follows things so i i love that show for all those reasons so i so for me the the reading about the monarchy and stuff is always interesting to know it's like such a weird fluky thing mm. and it and like you said it changes you guys are like a little tiny island in the middle of a bunch of cold water and you conquered the world mm. like like Victoria, it took her a long time to actually get to India for the first time, but she was in charge of it. They would send her stuff from India. She's like, I should probably go. Yeah, you think? You, you it's your, So anyway, so what's your, if you could alternate history, like what's your moment in your life? It'd have to be in your life, like you're alive. Mm, yeah, it, so from the day, is there a moment in time where you're like. Diana not dying. 
I Diana think. not that's dying? in my life only because of the crown recently if 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 it was before my life there's other things that i'd be more mm-hmm. intrigued by you know like what if what if when america chose their language if they'd actually chosen french instead of english like i wonder it was how... actually between english and german sorry believe it or not. yeah it's fine because i get still, confused because yeah. of canada speaks french canada, Canadian, obviously, french. and obviously but the, Spa- so the spanish yeah. went over there but the languages were between english and german but canada yeah. speaks french uh, and then you know obviously south america's uh, <laughs> you know spanish, spanish and then also portuguese. randomly portuguese so yeah. anyway yeah. nonsensical and let's not even get into the caribbean islands um, yeah. because that's a whole other kettle of fish it's a whole like, different kind of language yeah, yeah. what what if a a the, the big history one would be what if Columbus never found America? Like what sure. what would have actually happened there? Um or what if America's native language wasn't English? Like how would that have changed the world? Because I feel like a lot of what's changed a lot of the reason why England is pseudo still in power, apart from the GDP and how much money and stuff, a lot of it is because the world's most powerful nation speaks our language and is kind of like our kid. I know that they're yeah, made yeah. from Europe, but like it was like, oh yeah, here's a group of kids that are going to go off and uh, make it. And all the parents were like, yeah, you go. And us, we were like, you know what? If we, we we're mad at you, but we still kind of like you. And then we had the the civil war stuff, and that was like yeah. the testy time of our relationship. And then after that, we repaired it, and we're like your biggest ally. So it's a weird thing that we have that be- I think part of it is language, you know. Sure. Um, because language, I think I'm not a religious person, but my favorite story in the Bible is the Tower of Babel. You know, obviously we're sure. both reading. I just well, you I probably finished. just finished it. There you go. Because you yeah. read things at light speed. <laughs> Um, I'm on like page 100. Um, I haven't picked yeah. up for a while because I'm reading a lot of Moonlight it's comics. It's fascinating. It, I'm it very takes excited. a turn. There's a, there's a part, I can't wait for you to read it because there's a part in there where it's like, do we need this part? And then because yeah. it, there's a lot you'll of get there. brutal bits at the start and I'm like, certain bits happen. I'm like, whoa. But the, yeah. the whole, the reason that book t- caught me so much and I want to read it is because of the Tower of Babel story. I love it, which is, yeah. er- according to the Bible, everyone on earth spoke the same language. They built a tower up to the heavens, basically, and God, this is layman's term, shortening a very big story. Layman's terms, Neil's like, no, you're not going to build a thing up to the heavens, destroy the, the tower and spread all you out. And now everyone in different continents and countries all speak different languages. So you can't communicate with each other and work together to make it up to heaven because Which, old testament god is a bit of a dick a bit of yes a genocidal maniac <laughs> and it's like let's just reset let's just murder billions of people let's try again you know noah let's go um but like the whole concept of that story is meant to be fear god but i always took it as could you imagine what power humans would have if we all spoke the same language and how many wars and things wouldn't happen if we all spoke the same language not even just because with language it's so weird because you look at the mental the chemistry of a one's mind when you speak your own native language and mo- become multilingual but also the way in loose terms this is not like for every individual but for example the way a french individual a, a native french speaker has grown up speaking french the way they would in some ways perceive the world and explain things is different to an english person who's done the, who's lived through the same life because the language in itself there are different words and different meanings and you know the way languages are all kind of set up there's different rules and things and so certain languages lend themselves to either certain ways of thinking or there's you know there's the the, the jokes which is like oh england have 20 words for beige but you know france has three words for this and it's that joking loose anecdote thing that people say the language it really does change a lot of what someone is and even when you become bilingual or, multi- or uh, multilingual when you can speak As several languages you know languages, you're about to marry a polyglot so you well, yeah, know exactly that. she yeah. speaks you know yeah. <laughs> uh, four languages basically fluently um and right. I'm, i've spent the last two years learning italian for 10 minutes a day and i could just about get by and i know a smidge of french but it's like the, the brain chemistry changes and i'm like that would be something really interesting even though that's not even a thing that's happened sorry that was yeah that's why my no, thought I, came I, from I, there. You know, I always thought i've always thought so, like, we have American Sign Language, you have British Sign Language, whatever. I always that angers me it, that that even exists, that there's two different ones. And exactly. I'm like, if when I found that been, out, it livid. But it's like, so if they had just made, and I know there is a universal sign language, but it's so it's so new that nobody, if everyone, so that's the thing. We could all, Babel could be real. We say Babel over here. Yeah. Um, all of that stuff could be real. But if we had just created a universal sign language, then that is the language everybody could speak. So if I could learn it, you could learn it, it wouldn't matter. And then somebody from China learns it, somebody from German learns it. Then we all speak the same sign language. And I know sign language only usually has like 13, 15,000 words, but that's what you need to get by. And yeah. then, because now I know the sign language, our signs the same, I can learn your spoken language, and then I can eventually learn your written language. So if I, if we have the same 13,000 base words, and you're like book, and you teach me book and sign, and then I learn book in English, I say book, and then you say book in whatever your language, and then you say that, and then what's book in Italian? 
Yeah. Well, it's the we reason learn it that way. And so that would be a cool way to break it down. So I've always thought that too, but we didn't do it because we're stupid. Yeah. Well, there is a language called uh, Esperanto, um, which actually gets referenced in Red Dwarf uh, quite a mm. lot, which is really interesting. Because um, when we watched it in Red Dwarf, uh, it happened because me and Megan have been making our way through the seasons because she's never seen it and I adore it. Um, she, Esperanto came, she's like, what language are they saying? And I was like, oh, I didn't catch it. And then we had subtitles, we put subtitles on just so we could hear what they said. And it was Esperanto. She's like, that's not a language. Is that made up for Red Dwarf? And I was like, I, I don't think it is. I was like, I'm pretty sure that's like a, a real thing. So I looked it up and there's a language that someone made. Um, I think I might have spoken about it briefly in Afterthoughts. I can't remember off the top of my head. But yeah, in 1887, someone basically created a guy called L.L. Zamenhof, created a language made from several other languages that was meant to be the universal language for the world. But obviously, the only way that would work is if every country agreed to have that as a secondary language. And the problem is, even by 1887, like the, that was, you know, 100 years after the Declaration of Independence was signed and all kinds of other th- stuff like that, where English... And, you know, in other places, you know, like uh, Cantonese, for example, um, that's a very big spoken language. Sure. It's already kind of formed. It was already a bit late. late. If someone had did that sort of, if Shakespeare had written in Esperanto, for example, maybe it could have changed the course of of that. But that is something I've I've thought about. That's what I was, I was looking down at my phone at, which was yeah. for Esperanto. But the, the sign language thing, I thought about learning sign language at one point. Obviously, now I'm trying to learn Italian. Yeah. But I'm like, why do people not, like it? I'm not even a person who has who's hearing impaired, but it frustrates me that people aren't just taught. Okay, we're taught French and stuff in school, um, and even though Spanish should really be taught because it's yeah. more used than French. Um, but default is well, French. You in guys school. speak French. You guys are so our French default second. Your, yeah, because of French. where you are. Yeah, yeah, but Spain is this almost the same distance. It's it's and yeah, also but more the people. Queen Mum the- owned the Channel Islands, and that's like right next to France. Come yeah. on. But no, barely you got anyone the speaks. Channel. But so few people speak French compared to Spanish. That's the frustrating thing. Is you sure. know, you've got France, you've got Belgium, you've got Canada, and then you've got certain African nations as well. And aside from that, there's not really many others. Whereas Spanish, for example, you've got whole regions in Europe as well as many Spanish islands, and then yeah. the vast majority of South America and Central and then, America, yeah, and also and Central, of course, because Mexico. And then also on top of that, Portuguese is a very similar language to Spanish. Spanish kind of came from Portuguese originally, right. so. And Megan says, if you speak Spanish well enough, and someone's speaking Portuguese, you could just about get by. There'll be a few. Is that little, right? Wow. Okay. Yeah, there'll be I a few little. That. that they're very similar languages. In I think she said the grammar's quite different, but the the words they use in a certain pronunciation. But if you were talking, you could get by. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's that kind of thing. So it's like Spanish is is more. You know, the the most spoken language thing on earth is Cantonese, just because the volume of people. And then I think English is like second or third, and Spanish is the other one because uh-huh. it's just spanish is spanish english are both very widespread like they're they're the two most common secondary languages in the world Wouldn't which have is, anything to do with that colonizer talk we had earlier oh no what the spanish inquisition going around the holy wars <laughs> and the end of the dark ages no what no all what? those all those uh, incans and mayans we see running around all the day all the time there oh, wait, no. there's like a yeah. small oh, collection of them in mexico yeah. who live near <laughs> chichen itza of a small right. village of a few thousand people left yeah. after we went in there and just wiped it all yeah yeah. So colonizer. what is your thing? So in your life. Oh, so sorry. Princess Diana. So what would I, that mean? How so, would it change? Like, cause I think if Carter had been reelected, we'd be driving hydrogen cars and there'd be a lot fewer wars. There'd be a lot of things. Be like the world, we'd just be in a different footing of peace and prosperity hmm. uh, and climate. Truly, truly. If yeah. he is, but like, so, but she was such a humanitarian too. So what, what could you see? So Reagan is elected. Thatcher is elected. Yeah. Diana lives. How does that how I does that alter things, do you think? The caveat would have to be Diana lives a long time, as in she'd still be alive today. That would sure. have to be the caveat. Because the problem is I feel like the path she was going down she again, a lot of this is from the crown and stuff I looked up up since the crown. But what it seems yeah. like is she was already quite and Rhea knows quite a lot about this. She was already quite and I don't like to use this word, but it's just for ease, quite a damaged person. She had a lot of issues, sure. a lot of baggage going on before she even got involved in the royal family. Then that just exacerbated everything. Then it seemed like she was coming out the other side before the crash. She was actually starting. She was kind of at the worst and then she was starting to recover. If she'd have continued on that trajectory and kind of sorted herself out and focus, like hyper focused on charity work and being a mum and all that jazz, I wonder if her impact on the world would have been greater, if the world would have been kinder. It's kind of like... The way I think about it in a, in a way is when Obama was in power, regardless of your thoughts on his politics, the general attitude of America was more closely aligned with Obama. When Then when you go, like the way he spoke, the way he held himself, what 
a nation values in certain ways. Sure. And when Trump got involved, regardless of your political views um, or even your personal thoughts on Trump, he was very impactful. And then his impact on America as a whole, obviously the capital city riots being uh, at the kind of peak of that kind of exacerbation. Yeah. Him as an individual, what he did to the nation and how he made so many different people feel, I feel like Diana could have had that power. And if done, if she'd have gone down that road in the right way, we would be a more compassionate Britain. I don't think Brexit would have happened. I don't really? think, That'd yeah, be amazing. I mean, it, it was very close. It was like 1% difference. And I feel like if it's a vote, and there's a lot close, of people who didn't vote. Yeah. Can't and I feel like name. if it's a vote that that is that close, when you've got a 1% difference, just say, okay, we're going to table this for now. We'll do it again in five or 10 years. Like why you can't, you, you don't let our pol- politics, if the, if the vote isn't a substantial majority in our polit- political system, you, the, the votes, it stops. It goes, right, okay, well, you both got 55 and 45%. That's not enough. We're doing it again. That's how our politics works. That's why there's coalition governments in the past because they've gone, oh, we've got this amount and you've got that amount. If we combine, we've got enough to be this Correct. majority. Yeah. yeah, that's and how so you guys I feel work. Like, we don't work that way, but you do. Yeah. yeah. And so if you think, realistically, it was 1% difference because it was 51, or is it, it was like 51, 52% to 48, 49%. Uh, ignoring all the misinformation and stuff was about, I just think there's enough people who could have been swayed by a compassionate leader figure Her. to sway that two percent because she was or so even ch- but it wouldn't even have to you know what it, it wouldn't even have been persuaying the two percent it would have been getting the other people out to, to vote. vote and exactly. that to me that's the most important thing to me it's like i live in a state that when we moved here was a purple state and we yeah. meet what that means is that it was like some like it vote people vote you know, they voted for obama they voted for you know romney so you know that's interesting that's I kind of want to live in a purple state. I want that. I want there to be because purple means compromise. Yeah. It's but and the thing is, is DeSantis only won by a razor margin his first election, and it was the guy he ran against was pretty flawed, and he had a drug problem, and he had some corruption and whatever, and all that other stuff. So if it had been a different candidate, I think DeSantis wouldn't have won. But he barely won. And then by the second election, he like rolled the guy over. And but during COVID, he was like all the crazy stuff, and now he's all the you go woke, you go broke, and I just hate him. Really, truly, he's the worst. But it's just like that. It's like one. It's it, it. It's the people who in that first election, the one that he barely won. If five hundred thousand more people voted, or fifty thousand more people voted, Trump won Michigan, Trump won Wisconsin, Trump won Pennsylvania by a combine of fourteen thousand votes. Now. I'm going to throw my mother under the bus because she's not going to listen. But she didn't vote at all in that. She voted for like down ballot, but she didn't vote for president. She didn't like Hillary. I get it. I'm not a big fan either. But historically, I always voted third party. I'd vote libertarian. I'd vote green party because I kind of wanted a third party. But in that election, I was like, nope, can't do it. This time it's too dangerous. He's dangerous. But so many people just like Hillary so much that they just did. They stayed home. Turnout was low. They did the same over him. Right. It's the same thing with Brexit. So that's what I'm saying. So it's not even that the 2%. So when people are like, oh, my vote doesn't count, my vote doesn't count. Well, ask Al Gore about your vote not counting. You know what I mean? Ask Hillary Clinton about your vote not counting. Because that's like so few people. Brexit, 50,000 more people. And you know, you can't blame Scotland this time. No, no. Can't blame Scotland. Never blame Scotland for anything. Okay, good. Good for you. But you know, that's the joke. Blame Canada from the South Park. But like the, they did everything they could do. Well, now they want to separate again because they're like, these English yeah, they're people. They're like, fuck you. They're like, we, we already hated Europe. the English yeah. and now you've done this as well. And I'm like, yeah, I, I don't blame you. Like, I'm, I lost yeah. a lot of faith. No, with the Brexit thing, a lot of it as well, annoyingly, was just misinformation. You know, sure. I, I, there's a friend of mine who I respect very much and respect their opinion a lot, but they voted to leave Brexit because they heard that house prices might go down. And they were desperate because the housing crisis is so bad. And this was, you know, several years ago now, and it's even worse now. But it was so bad, it was so hard to even afford a house if you're a young person. Mm-hmm. Willing to, you know, they didn't think they were going to destroy the... I mean, the, the country didn't get destroyed by Brexit. Very severely damaged in a lot of ways, and who knows how long it'll take to recover. But I don't blame them for doing that. I, it's always that kind of thing where misinformation on both sides for leave and remain. No one really sure. knew what was going on. It was a snap election done by a prick who just did it for an ego thing to try and quiet his party. And didn't he thought for sure he was going to win. He was just like, let's just quiet this stupid Brexit talk here. We'll call it. We'll be done with it by the afternoon. And then it fucked the whole country up. And you're like, great. Thank you, you stupid And then he head. quit immediately yeah, after. Straight too. away. I'm gone. And it's like, yeah, and he, I believe he sang. David Cameron. Quit. Yeah, Cameron. Oh, yeah. Right? Such a prick. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so anyway, uh, and I have, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not specifically left or right leaning. I'm more sure. center left, I'd say, more yeah. than anything. But 
if you're a prick, you're a prick. But the thing is, what happened is situations <laughs> like that occur. Facts. We, it's just, it, it frustrates me when people don't take responsibility for their actions. And when you've just got all these people, it's like the whole 2008 recession, the banking crisis. Like yeah. Iceland was one of the only places that actually jailed people for it. And we we're like, oh, well, well, how about you don't give yourself a bonus? But actually do give yourself a bonus. Just don't tell anyone. And you're like, pathetic. Um, but that's in politics and money and all power constructs yeah. in the capitalism world. That's just how it kind of feeds in because the foundations are so broken and no one's willing to change it because the only people with the power to change it are the ones benefiting from the system. So p- yeah. who knows? But yeah, the, the voting thing was funny is in Southampton, uh, you know, where I'm from, um, there was a local election or actually it might have been a general election, but we do it like not not far off from America. It's, it's slightly more different elements, but basically a group, a city, all votes, and then they're the representative of that city uh, is put into um, the House of Parliament and gets the vote. Yeah, the MP. Stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah, Member of Parliament, MP. Um, so ours was, I think the vote, I calculated it, I think it was in one of the elections in the last few years, it was Conservatives who won were only 30-something votes more than Labour. So the right. difference, I worked it out that... I think it was if nine, it was 30 something. So something like if 19 people who didn't vote had voted Labour, it would have changed that seat. And that seat change would have made the majority different, which would have meant that the Conservatives in that election would, wouldn't have got into power without doing a coalition government or something. It would have literally, there was like one in it. And that mm-hmm. translated in, uh, in my city to about thir- either 30 people, it was like 20 people voting who didn't vote or. 15 people who vote conservative changing their vote or something like that yeah and it was just like when i saw that and i i have been politically apathetic in the past you know because i've tried honing in on politics and that just gets depressing and you realize that even you'd rather read about space politics well it's more, so much more fun because i loosely it's way know more that, fun. Yeah. Well, it's also like if i know that someone's you know committed genocide i know they're not real whereas in this country yeah. it, you know when we live in worlds where our respective nations have literally committed genocide and it's part of our sure. history that they kind of glaze over and you don't really find out till you're like 30 um yeah. and it's it's just so frustrating that when you get into politics america's the worst for it where you go oh here's a person on the left here's a person on the right oh but they're both still friends with epstein they're both still being lobbied the both the budgets for both sides 40 percent of the whole of the america budget is still going on war regardless of who's in power the difference might tweak by a percentage or two but the whole pie chart of spending doesn't actually change that substantially in the grand scheme of when you get to the trillions and so when that was happening in america and obviously it happens here as well i'm just like a point i've been so apathetic because i'm like i don't give a shit if you're you or you you're both gonna lie you're both gonna do whatever you want to get into power and then I think as I've gotten older, I'm more compassionate. I'm like, okay, but if this person gets some power, that person gets the power. Only three laws are going to change in a year. But one of those laws could affect someone I really care, care about. about. That's happened. like Because the conservative Same. power, I have several friends who've got issues like fibromyalgia and Crohn's and all kinds of different diseases where they need regular medication for and things. And they can't work in the same capacity that someone like myself who doesn't have any physical ailments can work so the problem is is that where certain things happen because the conservatives are in power and certain benefits have been cut it means that certain friends of mine have overtly suffered and lost hundreds of pounds a month because a certain benefit scheme has been changed and it's little things like that when you look it's very difficult politics because there's a very big picture and then there's a very small picture and it's kind of like you almost have to look at each slice a little bit just to kind of loosely figure out. And then you get to the manifestos that we have, which is like a 100-page document explaining everything they're allegedly going to do, and they only do like 10% of them anyway. And it's like, I have to read, what, five of these? To, and in your in your situation, probably three or four, if you want to be, have balanced perspective. And you're like, no. I had to skim them, and even then it was like, this is rough. So I ended up a lot of the time just going on a online thing, and it says, here's all the policies. You kind of, you do like a quiz almost. It tells you political alignment and stuff kind of do that and then skim through the manifesto make sure there's nothing heinous in there and then loosely vote but the amount of research it takes to do that and oh, yeah. it's so hard Exhausting. because sometimes it doesn't do anything not do anything well, but it's, it's, it's okay. very important like, it is very important i don't want to downplay importance of democracy and what we have and the privilege i don't want to i want to say people should vote but i think that when you're an individual who's not directly being affected by the fringe laws it's very easy to just focus on the anarchist in me that's like fuck all of them let's fuck anyone else do you know what i mean that's the problem yeah i do no i do and i do think so there so there's two things there true all that is true but that is also the intent right so like 
to me, like Engl- we were talking, we were talking about language and all this stuff. English is a stupid language. Yep. I am an English teacher. It's a dumb language. It's intentionally a difficult language. The easier the language to learn, the more it reaches the populace, right? So English, you can easy to speak 26 letters, not that many sounds. Really, we could get away with fewer letters. Do we need C, K, and S? Can we just pick two? Right? Like, do we need all three? Like, there's so many things. Like, do we, like, why is Y sometimes an I sound? Like, what are we doing? Like, we can get away with dropping the I and just use Y, right? Because we understand how sounds work. So, like, because if you can spell Brian with a Y and Brian with an I and it sounds the same, what are we doing? So, but language is the English language was to, was specifically like the rules are, are, archaic and really difficult on purpose so that only people in power could read it. And then if you can't read the language, if you can't read the the, the hundred page manifesto could be eight pages, but you make it a hundred for everything that you just said, the more complicated you make it, the less interested the electorate is or anybody is. And that, I mean, the whole thing, you know, when you say knowledge is power, it's absolutely true, but it's also being able to read, being able to empathize, reading books are empathy machines, you know, like whatever the book is. I mean, my book is just, you know, young adult books, p- people walking around talking about like, there's there's a bit of empathy, like you care about them. I hope when you're done with my books, you care about the characters and you, whether you learned something or didn't learn something, you felt a certain way. And And reading fiction, reading anything is important so that when it's time to do the heavy lifting, you can, but it's all deliberative. And so it's like, we're, we in our country are deliberately trying to dumb people down. Like the people who went to college, who have degrees, who went to elite schools are now saying, you don't need to go to elite schools. That's a joke. You went to that school. You went there. What you don't want is this guy or this gal or this non-binary person to go to the school and get the education and usurp you. You don't want them to know what the word usurp means because if they learn that, then they're going to usurp your sorry ass because they could read your bullshit. And so like language is everything. So English was designed to keep people down. And then, and then interestingly enough, it was like nuns. It was because religious texts were written and only the religious scholars could read them. And then the preacher would stand up and tell you what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. And you're like, but wait. And then the nuns learned how to read because of course they could read them. And then they were like, well, we should start schools and teach all these women and these poor people men to read women of any stature as we discussed and these poor men to read um and then they'll know and then they can read the bible then they read it they're like this seems like some bullshit but it's also words now i know words and i know you're lying and then once i have that knowledge i can make my own thing so it's like all of it comes down to it's that intentionality and it's like the ability to so you know like bread and circus, right? The whole thing is you just keep people fed and you keep them entertained and you keep them stupid. And and I want to be entertained. I want to watch Sharknado. I want to listen to a silly song. I want to talk passionately about Weezer. I, you know, like I want to do all those things. But I also like, I, I also know that I can do that because I can read. I can and do. And I'm not trying to like, I don't care what you read. Detective comics, just read the, you know, read Read the newspaper, read, you know, um, whatever. I don't care what it is you're reading, read whatever it is, but you have to do it so that you can. And that is it. You make things harder. You make the language difficult. You make people feel stupid for not knowing how to read. You make people with reading disabilities, people like we were just talking about universal sign language. You make people with disabilities in general, you make it hard, you make access harder for them. So it's really frustrating to me. And it really truly does all come down to like just being literate. You know, and I, and so, so that you know, it to to me that is it. The whole everything, <laughs> that is the answer. Words, words are the answer. Whatever language it is, I love that you're learning Italian, so you can talk to Megan's family. I'm sure they talk very fast, and even with your limited Italian, you probably can't keep up. Too but good. I love that. I love that you're doing that. That's beautiful because again, it's not that you want them to be talking. You're like, are they talking about me? Maybe, but also. You just want to be, that's like respectful to them. You want to be able to communicate with them and then, you know. Language is culture. Inf- yeah. And right. And be informed when you're there. And so, you know, every, everything to me comes down to that. And so it, it is like you talked about, like, so if Diana lived, she's there being compassionate. What did she do? She ran charity. She helped the poor. Well, how many nice. more kids just would have known how to read 
that could have read the bullshit and, and got through the misinformation and voted the right way because it's the spotlight. It, right. Yeah. And that's all. So, so it is, it, it, and yeah, I get, I get fired up. You know I mean? It's like my job is frustrating and I know Megan has talked about it before. She and I have talked about it together. Like being a teacher is frustrating. Her job, I think is harder because of the age range she teaches. My job is getting more difficult because of the culture wars in my country. And again, the culture wars are all based on bullshit and lies. If you could just read, if you could get through the data, and 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 I always think you can always beat bullshit with facts, right? But you have to know where to find them, and have someone who's receptive. Because some people, as we read in that Michael Sher "How to Be Perfect" book, yeah, like yeah, this, right, exactly. People literally you sh- you present them with objective facts to challenge their thoughts and their own opinions, and they will just absurdly double down and refuse yeah. to even consider. And it becomes this horrible situation where you're like, I'm. I'm literally, I'm holding a red ball. No, you're not. I'm like, but yeah. but I, I, I don't know how else they can know you're lying. That's actually a, that's a blue ball. You're painting it red. It's like, but it's, yeah. it's a red ball. And it's like, I don't understand how much more simple I can prove to you this thing. And right. they're just like, nope, it's green square or whatever. And you're like, yeah. what do I do? <laughs> yeah, you don't. Well, Anna Kornikova, um, who's a who's a sociologist and psychologist and now professional poker player, she actually, I, there's an article of hers I use in a class called I Don't Want to Be Right. And it's about this. It's about that. It's like truncates that down in a really great. What's it called? Uh, it's called um, uh, I Don't Want to Be Right, Anna Konakova. Cool. She's Russian, but now she lives in America. She's a professional poker player. And actually, I, I actually just stumbled into one of her books about her turning poker pro. I'm like watching poker one night. And I was like, that looks like Anna Konakova. What, is this a celebrity tournament? Whatever. And it's like, and of course, then I realized I knew who she was and thought she's a celebrity enough to be in a celebrity poker. <laughs> like, that's where my brain went. Not like she must have got, she must play poker professionally because like she's not a celebrity. <laughs> to me she is i use her work in class i know who she is i recognized her <laughs> and then i then it was like and then in the little thing underneath she had this book about about it called the biggest bluff and it's amazing it's a great book but i use i use her because she she does study social psychology which i find fascinating and again like michael Schur's book is amazing and i think there's a great book just did it in literature for life it's a book i read before it's called sapiens oh, um yeah i've heard of that book harari oh my god and it is you would love it because it actually the whole thing is like all of this conversation that we're having is not is a fake. It's all based on lies because language is a lie, religion is a lie, money is a lie, everything is a lie. Human existing that's not a, that's not a lie, but like language is a fiction. Mm-hmm. You can it's a fact because we've written it down and we've created rules, we've created grammar. Like like Megan saying Portuguese and Spanish have different grammar. That's fiction. That's dumb. Why did you do that? Because you, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's a power grab is what it is. Yeah, yeah. But it's like, so it's a fascinating book. He's written three books about like humanity, but like Sapiens is so fascinating. And I think you would totally dig it. But those are the things that are important. And we need to read those things. We need to grapple with those things. We need to think the big thoughts. And but so that we can talk about Weezer, so that we can sing a song, so that we can go watch Barbie but Barbie, for all of its silliness, is really thought and smart and, you know, in, in like it. a socially significant movie. I loved it. I think it's spectacular. I hope things swing around and they, and she, that, and Greta wins and it wins Best Picture because it is exceptional. It's so important. But you can also look at it if you don't want to see how important it is. You can just have a good time in that opening Lizzo song where she's singing what's happening is one of the greatest things that ever exists. Like Lizzo just singing what's happening on the screen. I'm like, Lee and I were trying to break that down. Like, so they gave Lizzo this opening scene and are like, here you go. And she was like, I'm just going to write what's happening, but also make it rhyme and also play flute. And I'm Lizzo and I'm fucking awesome. And why didn't Lizzo show up as a cameo, <laughs> as a Barbie? I was a little disappointed at that, but like, that's j- joy. Like you should, but, but you still need to like, there, that's the whole thing about having the bounce. Like you have to take it seriously. Like I write every, I, I wish I could write every day. I don't write every day, but I also make a choice. Like if I didn't like, I was like, I'm going to talk to Mike today. I had a shit. I've had a shit couple of weeks at work. I was in meetings from noon, my time, right up until I met with you for, so for two and a half hours. That meeting that I walked out of could have kept going, but I was like, and I even said to, to the boss, I was like, listen, the thing I have to do next is just for me, but I need to do it. I need to stop and do it because this is important. And this has been on my books for over a month and it's going to be fun. And I need this. We need to just have this conversation. But 
Also, I mean, and I think we were supposed to talk about Welcome to Mansfield because you I've, finally finished we've, it. We've still got, um, I mean, I finished it a while no, ago. No, have it's you fine. No, good, and sir. it's totally fine. We've no, still totally got time fine. and I have, I've got no. it on my note. I was waiting for you and I no, will no. ask you a question about your damn it's book. Okay. That's so I was going to finish no, on the, it. The, the point is, well, thank you. But the point is, it's like just us doing this, just yeah. us having, like these things are important, but we, we can do these things because you find the balance, right? You have to, you, it all comes down to that. It's like, it's like we started talking about like, you know, filming everything. It's like finding the right balance. And I think that is the answer. Like be super religious, but don't let that control your life. Like be aware of the fact that, and again, if, if you're super religious, don't read Harari's book. You're going to be really mad. <laughs> He's When he says, whatever you believe in is a lie, you're going to be like, oh, no, it isn't. And you're like, it is. A person made up your religion, just like we discussed. Your king made up the Anglican Church. There's a now- reason. Well, there's also there's a reason why 99.9 percent of all evolutionary biologists are strongly atheists. <laughs> there's correct. There, there yeah. is clear scientific reason why, right. generally yeah. speaking, the more you delve into scientific study, the less religious you become because it's like once you see behind the the Wizard of Oz curtain. You it's don't not as special, back. which is fine. Yeah. I, and I'm I'm fine with people believing there's some sort of you know deity. I don't. I think everything is. I don't is, begrudge anybody. No, and, and, and we, if that brings you comfort, right? Yeah, That's 100%. all that matters. And yeah. I speak to people I've had on the pod, people like Tonya, BZ, and Radhika, who have different religious um, beliefs and things, which I completely respect because they're lovely individuals and they're not, you know, trying to use religion as a way to essentially give weight to their bigoted views because they're all lovely people. Um, but like, it's one of those things I'm like, I don't believe in a God. I don't think so. But if there was one, cool. It's kind of like simulation theory to me. I'm like, I'm it, whether or not there is a deity or whether or not we are in a simulation, I'm still going to live exactly the same. I do things for people because I know it's the right thing to do and because potentially biologically speaking, it gives me serotonin when I do nice things. Not because I think I'm going to get rewarded in a pseudo afterlife, which the interpretation of what you reward will or won't be and what this weird point system is depending on which variety of religion got you my, choose. I've got my God checklist. Let's well, it's see a good what place. did I do today. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's like, yeah. oh, I, I subscribe to the Abrahamic religion. Well, you know, there are several and they all have slightly different meanings and slightly different interpretations on what is good and bad and just all that nonsense. I'm like, no, I'm... I'm I'm just going to try, I'm going to, I like the concept and idea of Jesus. And so I'm very loosely going to be like, yeah, what would Jesus do? Probably not be a dick or maybe get a sword out. I don't know. Um, but Jesus would definitely not be a dick. That was not no, his thing. That's, yeah. that's, there should be the rule of all religions. Just don't be a dick. It's, don't it's be a not dick. complicated. It's, but the core really of a lot of religions have that, you know, you know, do well, unto the neighbor, rule, right? do unto thy neighbor. Do unto, unto others as you yeah. would, as you would have them do unto you. Don't be a dick. Yeah. No, yeah. I totally agree. Um, uh, uh, Christopher. It'll come to me. There's this book called Christopher Moore. There's a book called Lamb. Have we discussed Lamb together? We've not discussed Lamb together. Christopher Christopher Moore. There's a book called Lamb, and it is called the Go- the Gospel According to Biff, Jesus's best friend. <laughs> that sounds amazing. It is amazing. It is so amazing. So it's told from Biff's perspective, and he grew up with Jesus, and he calls him Joshua, like because that would have been the closer translation to Jesus. Like he's yeah. like, I I called him Joshua, and so like there's this whole thing of like them growing up together and like as as jesus starts to get his powers biff is always there and um and so like there's a whole thing right before the sermon on the Mount where jesus and biff are talking and he's like well, what are we going to do what are we going to do for these people and he's like so biff's trying to help them take notes and he's like biff I, we're, we've given the poor this we're giving the lepers this what about the dumb fucks and he's like we got to make sure we give the dumb fucks something because people can't be misled and biff's like no no that's all you do is help the dumb fucks you don't need to say them everybody's going to know he's like no biff it's got to be so it is one of the most spectacular i mean and again if you are easily offended i wouldn't say but it's like it is it's just like when when we talk to mark we talk to mark I was about say, Island. Like second cup co- second coming, second coming is such a religious that is such a pro christianity book second coming but people would get so mad about it but like they're missing the point they totally missed the point second coming is like jesus is super awesome and who's a dick old school jesus Old school uh, Jewish God is a big dick, right? The Old Testament God is a huge asshole in that, and like Jesus is like just a hippie. And my favorite thing is the in the in the Second Coming when he like bumps into all the like anti queer people, and Jesus is like, "What is this true?" Like the signs of that all the like, and he, oh my god, so good. 
But yeah, I think it, it, Christopher Moore's Lamb is so spectacular. And again, it's an interesting commentary on what religion could do. The thing I'm for religion is that it gives you guidance and it gives you peace and it gives you rules because you don't have a good moral compass. Then great, do be afraid. Like because fear with a capital F, mm. you have to be afraid of God to not be an asshole. Fine. I'd rather that you're afraid that God is going to smite your ass so that you're not mean to your neighbor. I would just assume you don't need, like, you should just wake up and be like, I don't really like her, but I also am not going to push her over the balcony. Let's just stand, <laughs> let's just not engage. And that's the best, that's the best you can do. So, but if you need religion to tell you not to push your old neighbor off the balcony, then you need it. Right. So I'm for religion because it stops, you know, matricide. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's one of those, it's, it's, it has a lot of benefits. It's just frustrating that, you know, like every single construct we have in modern society a capitalism the monarchy whatever it all of it just kind of ends up being is it's the reason why communism can't ever really truly work is because it, it, there's always someone more equal than others if you have every member of the population completely equal but a tiny percentage of people who have the control they will you know power power corrupts it's just it, human nature even if it wasn't those collection of people even if you made a communist society that worked you had 20 people being the council or whatever and they were all the best people ever eventually a piece of shit's going to get in there and eventually there's going to be several of them and then eventually you've just got this horrible thing that doesn't actually work properly because human nature in a lot of ways unchecked human nature fucks everything up which is why free markets the idea of free markets is just insanity because anytime any corporation can make more money for any cost, they always fucking do. Because that's the point. It's why the corporation started. That's why the mechanic started being a mechanic to make money to support his family. It's not his fault that old Joe's company got bigger and bigger and bigger and then became this thing. And then over, you know, five generations, this Nepo baby is in charge of this multi-billion dollar mechanics and car manufacturing company. Like, it it doesn't... The con- constructs need to be in place to kind of uh, filter out and kind of uh, my view of what a government should be is a, a kind of the last parameter of things like let people be good people and kind of you know uh, do what they want loosely but just in case they go too far let's have police let's have laws let's have things in place let's have a cap on what people politically can spend in campaigns because yeah. it's better for everyone it's, it's little things like that but with that all in mind Tony with that all in mind there's a construct that you've been creating, which is a, a shared universe I have. of Jane Austen. It's, and it's funny. I didn't mean – I wasn't trying to be a dick. I, like, we just I, started talking, no, so it's no. fine. You I wanted to make like, sure okay. it wasn't just a five-minute quick thing at the okay. end because we've got a little okay. bit more time. Um, but I read your book a while Thank ago, you. actually. Yeah. Um, I mean, we've spoken loosely about I it. I saw things. a lovely review on Goodreads. Yes, I did leave you Thank one. You. And I'm, I'm planning on recording a lovely review for you audio wise at some point Ooh, not, after, not just for after you thoughts. Nice. after thoughts but i might release it to the public i'm trying to collect i'm trying to catch up before i go to america and get married and all that jazz i'm trying to collate a lot of afterthoughts content as well as some genuine chit chat content and so i can just before i go yeah. away just you know release it to the world and i'm aiming for one of those to be that um Thank but you. Yeah, it's. It, I'm doing it in chronological order. I've specifically not finished How to Be Perfect by Michael Schur. I'm on the last chapter. So I'm good. not finishing that last chapter, which is only, I think, about eight pages, because I've got six other book reviews to do. I recorded one the other day, so I've got five book reviews to do. And then once I've done them, I'm letting myself finish the book so I can do an afterthoughts on it. Nice. But I did finish Welcome to Mansfield a while ago. Thank you. Yeah. Um, it was a couple months ago now, actually, I think. Um, and I loved it. Um, it's Thank behind you. me, actually. I, I was meant to get it out... And do what I do when I speak to other amazing co- accomplished authors and put it on my special little stand behind me. Oh. Um, but I've actually got Eye of Darkness there. But I, I here's see. the book. Yeah, so I've got oh, it physically. Nice. And I bought it specifically in hardback. You did, um, which has got the co- which has got my picture on the back and the on the inside flap. Yeah, your nice little yeah. silhouette. Yeah, all of them will be in silhouette. Because that's on your the, website, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then so the covers are will also always be a silhouette. Yes, I remember you saying because you were yeah yeah so it'll be that yep yeah that yeah. cool the hard cover is cool because when you take the when you take the book jacket off yeah it's still the cover yeah I think it's covered without any text isn't it yeah isn't it that's so pretty we didn't know that I didn't know it was going to be like that until I got a copy yeah because I, I got um, my I, I always want hardcover there you go there it is nice so cool. I, I always cool. prefer things in, in hardcover um, because a value is one thing but also I just like the hardiness like if I I like. I like listening to certain audiobooks, but I like physically having a book in front of me. Uh, I mm-hmm. like having some sort of trophy of my ima- sure. uh, imaginary conquest. And so it's 
Yeah. I loved the book. Um, Thank and you. we spoke about the book before its release. We did. Um, so I hadn't read it and I knew nothing about Jane Austen apart from yeah. listening to the audiobook of Sense and Sensibility. And then, Emma Thompson is the narrator, correct? Was, yeah, yeah, it was I think it was Emma Thompson. The, the collection yeah. was done by a group of very uh, interesting uh, British women and I believe that was one of them. Um but it was brilliant. Um and I hadn't consumed any Jane Austen content and your book was so enjoyable that it broke my spell of only reading Star Wars content. Like I, I mentioned that, that to you in the, the uh, thousandth show. Thousandth Comics Emotion episode, um, which will be released in the coming weeks. Um, it's just going to, well, yeah, yeah, probably two Sometime months. Sometime in probably March at this point. Yeah, probably yeah. probably before April 24. Um, but it's just because, you know, releasing content on Comics Emotion, yeah. we need to get to episode 999 before we can release yeah, yeah. the thousandth episode. Um, but you, reading your book, it actually, it, it made me want to read more non-Star Wars books because I've always... I've always known the the dissonance in my own mind, which was always been, I like reading Star Wars books because if I read a book that's not that amazing, but it's Star Wars, it still adds something to the world, or in my the lore world of Star Wars. And even an okay Star Wars book, I still get enjoyment out of it. I, st- I have sure. the joy. Um, but what I've been doing is overloading myself with Star Wars content. And because every time I consume Star Wars content, I was making a podcast about it or whatever, it was becoming a job. And every book I'd read, I'd read a chapter, then I'd have to write down a bit, et cetera, et cetera. And it got very tiresome because I, I didn't want to just... I was basically rewriting the plot down of a book I was reading, but I had to stop every time I got through a chapter and some interesting character popped up. I had to make note of it. So I took a break and I read Book of the Man's Food because obviously I wanted to support you. Um, and I enjoyed it so much. I was like, I need to now put a line in the sand it's one of the reasons why i've reduced my comics and canon output to read more non-star wars content instead of being the fear that's not going to be good is that primarily get recommendations from people i trust so i know it's not going to be bad like i do the weird thing is with movies that are not connected to the mcu i love indep- i don't like franchise movies very much unless it's yeah. horror or unless star wars or horror i don't mind mcu stuff you know but i don't like franchise movies that much i really love standalone that it's you sit I down yeah. and you, you start a journey you finish the film and that's the end of the journey i love that so reading books that work that way like when I've been reading Babel and stuff, I'm like, I can just pick up this whenever I want. There's no pressure to finish it any time or right. read it. I don't have to write notes or anything. And so your book spring-loaded my wanting to consume sort of less Star Wars content and stuff. So now that it's been out for a while, you know, mm-hmm. um, we won't delve into the plot because we have to do an entire podcast on that, really. And I know we've got, we've loosely discussed plans in the future to uh, do something sure. with yourself and with and with Ada. Ada. Yeah, yes. yeah. She yeah, and yeah. I, she, I have my meeting with my publisher yeah. I'm, in two days. Mm-hmm. So I'll have more information. Ada and I were just talking and she's like, why don't we do that thing with Mike? And I was like, listen, man, I don't know. I don't know when the book, I don't know when the audio book's coming out. So once the audio book comes out, yes, we'll, we'll be give back time on. That'll be like the, the promo yes. thing and for you that. And you can make Ada do all the voices live wow. on the show. That'd be a good preview. It'll that be amazing because but- Maggie's British and you can, adju- you can, um, you can see how she did. So I want, well, yeah, that that would be good. I, I like uh, judging <laughs> Americans doing a British accent. Um, yeah, yeah. But like, I I love the book. To clarify, um, and I know you. it is technically a franchise book because shared universe, it but it works as a standalone. You don't need to. That's the hope. Know, yes. Yeah, exactly. But it, like, it works so well, and I know nothing about Jane Austen. Um, I've been to her house because of you. I which went is there amazing. Stuff, which but I've did, got the picture of that. Yeah. And Lee has the little book you sent sitting on her desk. Yeah. yeah. So I've done. I I know very little about her, but uh, we spoke a little bit about adap- how to adapt to work and things like that. But I want to ask, like. How is two two pronged question because we are running out of time. But like, um, what is what has your experience been with the book um, since its release? Because I know you've done quite a few talks and things that have been really really cool to hear about. And then mm-hmm. I'm only saying this. The, the question is separate, but I'm saying it because you and I are going on a tangent. Otherwise, yeah, is music and Mansfield. I know yes. that could probably be a whole podcast in itself. But the you touched on it earlier with Tesla yeah. um, and Junior. So like. Music and Mansfield, how has music interacted with your writing style? So you can sure. answer False. either of those. Okay, so the book, it's been amazing. I mean, you know, it's I'm not, I'm selling books, some. And it's, so people out there, like people I know and who are my friends and are reading my book, and that is very awesome. Um, you can go to worldcat.org um, and somebody has, and you just type in welcome to me, it's worldcat.org is the world library. It is. It has. It, so not every library puts their books in a world cat, and not every library is is detached. But most of them are. There is a library in England has a copy of Welcome to Mansfield. I don't know who put it in. I don't know who requested it, but it's amazing. Um. Uh. So I check that every once in a while. So it's just cool to be like, oh, this library in uh, the University of Colorado at Boulder 
it now has and, and one of my one of my admissions advisors i went to school in boulder but i didn't go to uc boulder i went to naropa but so i know somebody who teaches there who works there now so he must have hayes must have requested it it's insane um so and uh my friend um amber who went to school with me grad school with me she's a, she works in a library and so she's getting it for her library so that's like that's still the dream i want everybody to request it for their library. If every library in the world requests the book, it's a bestseller and nobody ever has to buy it. And then it's access and it is communism, right? Socialism exists in the libraries and I'm here for it. So it's been very cool um, to see it in libraries. I We went down, we did a video of us found in the wild. We went to the library in the On next county down. Myself. Yeah, and it's there. There's a video of it there. So that is very cool. That is cool anytime that happens. So I love when people buy it. I love that people want it. I can't wait for the audiobook to come out with Ada. But like seeing it in libraries, because again, that's where the poor kid, the poor kid in me was like the library is the place, right? That it makes it accessible to everybody. So I would love everyone to buy one, but but if you can't afford it, request it in your library, physically or digitally, on Hoopla, on Cloud Library, on Libby, whatever your library app is, request it. And then, you know, request a physical copy if you can. And that would be amazing. Like, the more people, the more libraries is in, the more people it's in front of. So that has just been cool to see it in libraries and just to have the talk. I did a book talk last week. There'll be a video. It should be out now. Lee probably put it out. She does all my social media. So if you go to Instagram, there's probably a video of me doing the book talk at Copperfish Books here in town. Mm -hmm. Very cool. And then a book club. Actually, a uh, local book club has picked Welcome to Mansfield for their March book. Oh, and so they've invited me to their book club meeting. And and um, Jax, Jax Emma is um, going to pick Welcome to Mansfield for her pick. So I'm going to zoom in to her book club whenever it is. So like that's what I would say, too. If people are like, hey, Welcome to Mansfield, if you pick it and you reach out to me, I will come to your book. I will come and talk to you at your book club. And there's questions would, at the back for book clubs. There are book club questions at the back. Yes, which is super cool. Um, so that has been going well. So the music. So I... Before I was diagnosed with ADHD, I had it, right? You don't have to get diagnosed to have it. But I love music. Um, I have been listening to music. There's like, pic well, like there were very few pictures. You know, like, again, pictures were expensive. But there was a flood at my parents' house. And so all the pictures are gone. But when I was little, there was a picture of me, little me, with these over-the-ear headphones like this, laying in a, be in a bean bag in the, in the downstairs with the record player. And they were like, you know, back then when over the ear headphones were the only things you could have listening to music, I would lay in the beach, I would listen to the Beach Boys, and I would listen to them nonstop, and uh, just lay there and stare at the ceiling and sing songs. And then I would read and listen to music. And still to this day, I hate the silence. So I have my carry around my little MP3 player, Lee can't read with, with the radio on. Or music on. So I will listen to music while I'm reading. I'll listen to music while I'm working. I'm like doing discussion posts. I'm reading the words my students are doing and I'm typing and I've got music on constantly. So every book has a soundtrack and I don't know what the click is going to be. When I made the decision that Junior would like classic rock, um, Tesla was always kind of my favorite band from that era. So, you know, you write about what you know, but I also listen to different music. So, so if the, whatever album is mentioned in there, I was probably listening to that album at the time. But the reason I did that is because it's true. Like we like what our, we grow up liking what our parents like, and then we evolve or we don't. And I know, know people who like people my age who don't listen to any music that was released after 1968. Cause that her grandma is like, she's like grew up with a grandma, loved the forties and fifties and sixties music. And that's all they listen to. Listen to those. Don't, don't care about modern music at all. And I made junior like, she's so desperate to bond with her dad who's very distant. And so the thing that she could find a way in was music. I definitely bond with people over music. You and I talk about music all the time. That's why I love doing the show, the mandatory music show, because it's like a way for me to like get to know Max and Dave even more by the song, by the albums they pick. I want to say um, you directly have affected mine and Megan's relationship for the better because yes, you recommended AJR, AJR, which is her favorite yeah. band ever. And I, you, because of your love of Weezer, I already liked Weezer, but because yeah. of your love of them, I delved deeper into Weezer, yeah. got the Weezer fever, and then you and I did the whole discography. We and did. Weezer's one of Megan's other favorite bands. So That's it's AJR and Weezer, and they're obviously very closely connected because featured songs and all kind they of jazz. Songs so I just, yeah. because of you, yeah. me and Megan, we already I liked a that. few bands and artists similar, but Weezer yeah. and AJR are like our bands that we, whenever new music comes out from AJR Weezer, we're both equally excited for it. 
That's and there's no other bands that are like that, really, apart that's from nice. maybe AWOL Nation. So that's for you to yeah. thank, I just want and to say. That, well, I, I'm happy to, to, to share that joy. And actually, AJR reminds me of the Beach Boys. I've talked about that before, is that they're brothers, they're melodic, they write these amazing songs. They're ahead of their time. They do different things. They're, they're like somehow pop music people somehow are listening to them but like if you listen to good vibrations it still doesn't make any sense how that song exists like and he heard that in his head and then he wrote it like brian wilson was a genius and is a genius good vibrations is perfect like it's i can't I, I can't even understand it and i love it and it's like it's in the film love and mercy the woman who the character who plays Brian's wife says she called it his pocket symphony to God. That's what she called. That's the only way she could kind of describe it. Again, I'm not religious at all, but I'm like that totally checks out. Like it doesn't make any sense. Like good vibrations shouldn't work, but it like blew my mind. So music is just always there. I'm always listening to it. I've got favorite bands. Obviously I love the Ramones. I grew up on the Beatles. I grew up on the beach boys. Um, I love Motown stuff, but, but like, as I grew, like, I've always, I like all kinds of stuff. I like hip hop. I like, um, I like punk a lot. But I gravitate towards different things and, and different different characters. So, like when I was listening, when I was writing "Welcome to Mansfield," I listened to a lot of Tesla. I listened to a lot of Van Halen. Uh, I listened to a lot of Def Leppard. But like some, I listened to Queen a lot. And and some albums, though, some Queen albums just didn't quite work. Like different different eras of Queen, because Queen is one of the greatest, you know, most talented bands of all time. But they also the kind of do different concepts. Like some of their albums are a little more out there and a little less rocky and a little more, you know, disco-y. And those didn't always work. Like, I couldn't write to that. Um, there's a singer-songwriter I really like called Eric Hutchinson. He's he's out of Washington, D.C. and he lives in New York. Lee and I have seen him maybe five or six times. Um, actually, that right there, I don't, you probably can't see it very well, but right in the middle there, mm. that thing is signed by him. Oh, wow. So, I yeah, um, I, was in, I was in his Patreon and he was giving stuff away. And I won that as part of being in his Patreon. And then when he was here in fort myers we went and saw him and i took that and he signed it oh wow so he we got a glass marker so he could sign it so it's written to lee and i so it's pretty cool so but i love eric and i listen to him all the time but i cannot write to him for some reason every like i don't know what it is there's just something that doesn't there so as i'm listening to the music and i'm creating the song palette for the character um that is the music i listen to so like with the will which i wrote my for my mfa dissertation seven different characters speaking in first person present tense so there's different voices different everything so each character had a song that opened that got me back into them one song that i could listen to i could turn that song on and I'm into that person's mindset and then i then they each kind of have their own music that they listen to so as i would switch characters so if i'm writing as will he likes cake there's a song called shadow stabbing by cake that is start, starts with the sound of a typewriter and I love that song. So anytime I switched to Will, I played Shadow Stabbing, and then I would listen to Kick. Every time I wrote as um, Honey, I would listen to a lot of like more angry ska. For whatever reason, that was her. That was her music. She's angry. She's so the, each character kind of had a different soundtrack, and it just always works. It helps me be them and find them. And so this, almost. Yeah, and so for the second book, for Maggie's book. I set it up that her mom is kind of a music junkie. And so she just kind of grew up liking all kinds of music, but it was the, the singer songwriter, Matt Nathanson, who was the big key for me. So I listened to a lot of Matt Nathanson while writing. So and way, so way he, back. Yeah. The way, way back. That's Sorry, it. Yeah. yeah. Love that song. And so he, he, he's like the focal point. Like Tesla was the focal point. He was, the, he's the focal point for the second book. So there's lots of different songs and then I create the playlist. So you can go to the website and go to the music section and the playlist for the book is there. So you can listen along. Um, so I'm putting the playlist together for the third book already. That's a little more a little more eclectic because I didn't none of the songs can take can be later than the book. Because the book the, takes place the in nineteen eighty nine. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I remember. But I will, but as I told you, I was actually listening to um to the symphony, the Weezer Symphony, while I was writing um the third book it was just on it just kind of came on and and it just was happening and i wrote like a boss for like an hour and a half so then i was like oh i guess mary bennett is gonna like weezer and so i already have this whole thing because weezer will happen in real life just a couple years after she goes to mansfield so it's mary bennett who's the president of mansfield college but it's her how she gets to mansfield and wins the gift as a teenager so 
I already have this line written for the fourth book. She's going to be talking to Jane Fairfax about something. She's going to make a Weezer quote. She's going to say a, we- a Weezer line. And Jane will be like, you like Weezer? She's like, I was there. Hunt. I was there at the beginning for Weezer. Like, <laughs> how old do you think I am? And so I can't wait for that line because – So, but I couldn't write Weezer in – to that. So just the characters. Have, so some music works, some music doesn't work. Some music is a distraction. Certain albums um, don't work. So like, I really love Amy Mann, but Amy Mann didn't go solo until after. So a lot of till, like till Tuesday just showed up in, in May. And so, because Mary is a little more eclectic, there isn't one particular thing. Early REM has really helped with this, with this album. Um, Fleetwood Mac, which is Lee's favorite band. That's one of Megan's sh- favorites. Yeah. They show up a, a lot. Um, in there, so yeah, the music just matters, and so I, 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 I don't, I can't imagine not listening to music every day. There's never a day that goes by where I don't listen to music. I, we listen to we listen to the radio when we eat dinner, so then it's just random, which is fun. Um, we'll stream it though. We like iHeartRadio because you can control it a little bit better. But like the local radio is fine too. There's just so, the commercials are so much longer. Like iHeartRadio, it's like song, song, thirty second commercial, where regular terrestrial radio is like. Song, song, four minutes of commercials. I was like, I don't want to buy a car that much. 30 seconds. Every Listen, I'm telling you, people would listen to terrestrial radio and watch terrestrial TV more if it was like every com- there were more commercials, but they're only 30 seconds. Agreed. I, I watch a show called Taskmaster and it airs on Channel 4, our main channel, uh, well, yeah. our fourth main channel, and yeah. also on YouTube. They've got all the episodes up to a certain season on YouTube. Yeah. YouTube adverts are f- either five seconds or a minute. Right. Whereas the Channel 4 ones are between like three minutes and six. And I'm like, I'm just going to go straight to YouTube. Right, exactly. So you get it. So anyway, so that is the music thing. So there's the music matters to me. And so like Jane Fairfax, who's the fourth book, um, she's she, I'm she's a piano player. So I'm slowly like, I already know Sarah Bareilles will probably be mm. there as part of her soundtrack, Ben Folds. Oh, nice. I tr- I, yeah, I try to pick the music that they like, but it also kind of has to be music I like. And sometimes I'm surprised. Like, um, Mayor, I was listening to some early Tom Waits, um, and, and you know Tom Waits. I don't know if you know who Tom Waits is. Um, <laughs> do you know? Did you ever see the? Do you know who he is? The singer Tom Waits. I, I know the I know the name, and I'm fairly certain He's, I have heard some of his songs. So let me yeah, go. Yeah, he acts now. You, you know him more as an actor. Like he he was the guy in Book of the Eli who was oh, who owned the junk shop. Love and, love yeah, Book yeah. of Eli. That's that's Tom. That's Tom Waits. Right. So, but like anyway. So I was listening to an old Tom Waits song, and it was like I it really worked really well. And all of a sudden, I wrote for like an hour without thinking, and I was like, it turns out Mary likes Tom Waits. I didn't know. So you just never know. Like I try, like oh Mary's totally gonna like this, and then it just I can't write, and I just have to stop, and I'll switch to something else. Um, so, so the music, every, every book has its own soundtrack, every character. Cause we all like what we like and we don't like what we don't like. And I feel like it's weird for me because I know people think it's strange that I write while I'm listening to music with words and I'm not typing those words, but it's because, and it only can be stuff that is like, as Weezer would say, that are my heart songs. I have to know the whole album. I listen to the albums. I don't write to the radio. I have to listen to the album. And so I know the order. I already know what the next song is going to be. Like it's in me, it's in my soul. So it's like, oh, this I'm listening to this Michael Penn album, which I love him. And so Amy Mann's husband, by the way, Sean Penn's brother, Michael Penn. Um, so I already know what comes next. Like, oh, if this happens, so I don't the song happens and it just lets me flow. So I am singing along. I'll even be like saying words out loud while I'm typing. I'm singing the words to a song while I'm typing other words. So yeah, it just it I I I really don't do silence very well like i'm the same we listen we listen to music at night and then when i can't sleep i actually put my headphones in and i'll actually listen to the bbc right listen to talk radio and that puts me to sleep at night that's yeah that's one step beyond me um you you are definitely more of an audiophile not in a negative yeah. way but than i am i'm I, yeah, I, yeah megan gets frustrated sometimes because i always want music on or something all the time always every yeah and the only times i don't is podcasting when i read it pretty much has to be classical music or lo-fi or something but i normally prefer to read in silence for the most part yeah. um and then sleeping silence um i if i sleep with something playing i end up being in that half dreaming state where i'm awake but i'm daydreaming and i can see whatever it is I so love if it's a that. song i'm super familiar with i can just see the video or i'm a very visual person i've got loads of music videos i've written down like minute for minute of what i would if i had to make a music video because i used to make music yeah. videos 
Um, and so there's loads of songs I hear and I've just got an image in my head. I know exactly how the music video would go in every way. It's just what a simple concept. And when that happens, and if I'm laying in bed trying to sleep and I hear that song, um, then that's what will happen to me. But aside from that, writing emails and stuff yeah. at work, either ridiculously nice. heavy or lo-fi stuff or classical, generally. Nice. W- w- stuff with words I can write a bit. Um, but we that's could talk... It for another two hours easy of course but we've got stuff to. we've got a life, got to life we to can't do. just talk life. to each other Lame. no I know. but i've written it down a lot of you, you're going to make me work for the show notes tonya's going to be happy uh because everything you've mentioned i think you are we, better at that like, than me i'm just like whatever i my I, show notes are so the, bad the problem is i get complimented on it so often and now you it's do. like you it's can a big win an part. award for show notes so I, know. I have to make it so that all the musical artists that we've mentioned all I the books you recommended you just yeah okay it's I've, I've written them all down um if i okay. can't find any because of spelling let you know, know. I'll, yeah. I'll let you know um but mr ar farina that's me anthony who i've never called you anthony and i don't like it no no him. well yeah. you americans do you say anthony we say the h yeah you guys are so weird. But you can you? spell Anthony like Anthony Blinken, our yeah. Secretary of State. He doesn't have the H. You guys, what are you doing to our language? Ugh. Dude. Um, and our Sundays. <laughs> and our Sundays. <laughs> Tell people where they can find you. Links will all be in the description. Yeah. And well, what AR Farina, ARFarina.com is the place to is the place to be. And that gives you links to everything. You could sign up for my newsletter there. And every month you get like, I know, like I love reading Tanya's newsletter. I love reading Allison's newsletter. You find out what's going on with them. I like write an essay because I just can't help myself. You do. You, it's I like do. a short story <laughs> in every letter. It's like I have to put time aside. I'm like, yeah. I need the toilet. Um, Is it yeah, going to be I, number one? If so, yeah, I can't read the newsletter. Yeah, yeah. So I, uh, yeah, I write a little essay. It's about like this one was January. So fresh start. So I send that out once a month. You can sign up there. If you sign up, if you're a new sign up, um, I will send you a link if you haven't read Welcome to Mansfield yet, but you would like to. I can send you a link to where you can get an ARC and you could get the ARC, the digital the advanced reader copy, in exchange for a review. So if you have read Welcome to Mansfield, Goodreads, Amazon, leave a review, wherever. Reviews are reviews are currency, apparently. So um, but I meet with my publisher in a couple of days, and so I find out the release date for that other Dashwood girl and the book three, which is called Universal Truth, which is uh, Mary Bennett's version of Pride and Prejudice is at 95,000 words and counting. So I should be done. I mean, pr- the publication date of Pride and Prejudice is the 28th of January. So the dream would have been to have been done by then. But since I only started the book on July 1st and it's January 23rd and I'm 95,000 words in, I feel okay. Yeah, so you've done a good job. That's what I'm up to. And you could go get, um, you're going to have Scott Weatherly on soon and you can mm. pick up Waxing and Waning, Essays of Moon Knight, because I'm in there. It is, it's downstairs at my bedside ready it's to good, read I'm, I'm just rereading the the 80s moon nut moon nut run and then bit of the 2006 the war on the lemire run, read the, the jeff one. lemire one that's what i wrote about I the see. jeff lemire one yeah. which year I'm was just that saying, the lemire i don't remember 2016 okay. maybe I it's the one I'm, that the show is based on oh okay amazing well I, yeah, I, yeah 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 I've, i will definitely uh, look into that because i've got a little that's note. a really good one yeah so anyway so i'm in there i'm around um wherever i'm on comics in motion into comic spotlight season's greetings Keith and I are actually going to steal this idea. We keep thinking like Keith wants to do a regular podcast and we keep coming up with different things. So we're going to start one soon. It's going to be called Keith and Tony talk about, and then it'll be whatever we feel like that. Instead of like trying to do a whole thing, it'll be like this time it'll be the TV show legends of tomorrow. And the next time it may be the original flash. And the next time it might be like the nightfall series, whatever we feel like, whatever nerd. How how cool are minerals, you know? Like yeah. I don't know how cool minerals are. Like well, that's why that, that's why you need to do a conversation on that. Like, do you okay, like, I don't know that what, either of us know the answer to that. But that's that's what you need out. to do. That's what yeah, I'm, okay. I'm so anyway, requesting so, for the show. Okay, yeah. So anyway, so yeah, Jack and I are doing the back to the bibliography, the the Blue Brew Baker Phillips stuff. So all kinds of stuff. Um, yeah, and I've got a two parter on Thema with Jess, where Is we it? talk about books. What? You never talk about books. I know. I know. It's so weird. So anyway, okay. that's me. What about you? Uh, I am doing stuff. Um, lots of different things. Find me on social media at Genuine Chit Chat. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, subscribe. If you're not, go subscribe there anyway. And the feed you're listening on Genuine Chit Chat, please subscribe. Leave reviews as a Tony said, reviews are currency, ratings on Spotify, all that usual jazz. Uh, what am I doing? Um, so I've got, uh, I'm recording a Scott Weatherly in a couple of weeks to do that whole Moon Knight conversation. Um, I've got a really weird conversation book tomorrow if it goes ahead. So that's going to be interesting. Uh, if it does go ahead the way i think um i've also got there's clone wars conversations coming out monthly as well um there's 
a lot of people that I've had on the show before I'm having on again this year. This is I, one of those times. Yes. I, I basically am like, this year is a comfort year for me because I'm getting married and all that jazz. So yeah. I'm like, let's get lots of people who are reliable, who are easy to talk to, and I don't have to worry if XYZ is going to happen because certain new guests, certain amount bail, which is just life. Um, yeah. But yeah, all that fun stuff. But supporting on Patreon, patreon.com slash genuine chit chat. Uh, myself and Megan release a bonus episode of that every single week, sometimes two. Loads of great things over there if you want to hear my thoughts on reviews and if you want to hear more from Megan. And she's amazing so you should she is amazing uh, and Dis- Disney Discussions 11 that's being recorded next week as well and that's Rhea's pick and the preview is mouse related uh, so yes good R-E-S-C-U-E Rescue Aid Society is that it? R- rescue is, is, the is w- w- one of them yeah one of the oh two. okay uh, nice we're formulating okay. them from a lot of the submissions we got, got we're okay. using a lot of those right right but yes, well, Mr. Tony Farina, thank you so much for coming on the show. I love speaking thank to you. you. It's always a delight. I love reading it your books, was. all your content, including your newsletters, and hearing from you on the various pod feeds. Um, but friends, thank you so much for tuning in. Subscribe, all that usual lovely stuff. Subscribe to Tony's newsletter and etc. Links in the description. I appreciate each and every one of you listening, and I'll speak to you very soon. <laughs>